Perfect. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we will wait the customary amount of time for people to come in. How's everyone doing today? Last day of the course. Whoa, whoa. Whoa, whoa. We got this far. And we've saved some great stuff for the final day. Time series. Reason why half of you are here, I, I hope. I think. We will wait another couple of minutes, I think, for people to enter the enter the course Zoom. Any sign of Haresh yet? No, but we confirmed that he is actually coming. <laughs> That's good. And Eric is here. That's like a quorum. So, um, okay, let's get going. Um, so, Day five. Congratulations, everyone, for making it this far. Um, we have a great lineup for you today. We're going to show you um, some time series uh, analysis that you can do with stacks of interferograms. We'll show you how to make interferogram stacks. Um, and we will, in about half an hour, have a demo of uh, the future. Of, of ice so this is today's syllabus um what we have is um uh a review period as we've had before um we will have haresh come in and, and tell us a little bit about the next generation of ice ice three uh which people at jpl have been working on feverishly behind the scenes for a few years now um after a break we'll then have a double session on uh, mint pie so yunjun who's the, the lead developer will will come and, and he will tell us a little bit about the, the 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 theory behind it how it works what the inputs are and then how you you use the software to the maximum uh the all the various corrections and things that you can apply and how you can interpret and analyze the results so that's uh should be should be a great um introduction to the to the world of mint pie and then finally at, at 1 p.m pacific rowena loman will come in and talk, tell us about um stack processing and how you prep data for that so that is what we have on on the docket for you today um and we start as always with um with matters arising from yesterday um results that people want to show questions that people would like to ask so if anyone out there has something that they want to share or, or ask us about, uh, please go ahead. And per tradition, we will hold an awkward silence until, until someone says something. All yeah, right. I, I, 
Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> okay, I can share uh, my results. So, so yesterday when uh, Eric was uh, explaining, uh, in addition to uh, atmospheric delay uh, in this part, actually this part exhibits some tropospheric delay, but for me, I don't see those things. So this is something uh, that that came up in office hours yesterday. Maybe Daniel would like to share his uh, solution to this. Okay. Yes. Okay. So uh, this dated back to uh, the Monday exercise, and I think it was one point four uh, when uh, Net RC was improperly um, had improper um, privileges, or so the the DEM is not was not being uh, properly downloaded or downloaded at all. So what we found out yesterday in mm -hmm. office hours was that uh, the the regional slope of the Big Island of Hawaii was not being subtracted because there is no DM information. So what you're seeing there is uh, somewhat corrected for the ionosphere, but it, it still has the the island uh, long wavelength slope. So what I did and it, it successfully processed in the end was to rerun 1.4. Uh, with its original um, XML setup, and then mm -hmm. verified, I verified that the DM was properly imported, and I could see the slope of the island. And then I reran reran the ionospheric compensation after changing the XML uh, setup for IONO, and uh, it came out correctly. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's very confusing when the. Uh... <laughs> The atmospheric signal is, is parallel to the topography in this case. <laughs> yeah, so like you can see that the corner of the of I guess the the volcano <laughs> Kilauea um in that in that interferogram. Well, it's, it's really the big volcano on Mauna Loa. Because Kilauea is just a little one on the side. Yeah, well it's the it's the slope of the island anyway. So that that you could convert the 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 long wavelength fringes in in your interferogram into a DEM of of Hawaii. Basically, <laughs> that's the shape of the of the of the slope. Yeah, you can see all the uh, the normal faults here on the south uh, side of uh, Kilauea, the the uh, Helena, uh, the, you know, the Helena polys. Yeah, but, so that's, but that that's... yeah, that really helps. Thanks, <laughs> I'm trying. Okay. But but that begs the question, uh, when we run the ionosphere correction without subtracting properly the long wavelength uh, topographic signature, is that the ionosphere being completely removed and all that we're seeing is just the slope? That would be a nice uh, experiment to do. Uh, it should be because uh, we're, the ionospheric estimate is using just the dispersive uh, or the part of the phase that's depending on wavelength. So the topography does not depend on wavelength uh, and troposphere and, and the surface deformation. So yes, I think if you if you really wanted to make a DEM for the for Hawaii, obviously you wouldn't choose a pair that has the um, the Daikin intrusion in it, but uh, you could use a pair that was earlier than this and do the ionospheric uh, correction to uh, get a better D, uh, DEM approximation. The uh, ICE software isn't really set up for making DEMs. The old Roypack software had a, a program for making DEMs from uh, interferometric pairs, but uh, that was never implemented in ICE that I know of. Uh, no, you would have to compute the ambiguity height as a function of position, right? And then, yes, then multiply by the unwrap phase somehow, and then geo, uh, you have to geo reference it. I mean, it could be done. That makes sense. Thank you. Anybody else got something?
running the danger of, of hogging time here myself. Uh, I just want to share uh, my downsampled quad tree decomposition for the Kaiko Kura 2016. Ooh, that's going to uh, be complicated. <laughs> yes, it, it, it's it's a tough one, but I'm sticking to it for now. Um, You're not going to be able to model that one with one fault plane. I, I'm... <laughs> I, I'm doing... Uh, yeah, I, I'm splitting the problem, but my the feet. No, wait, that's not the one I'm looking for. Stop share. Pardon me. Uh, desktop two. There you go. Share. There you go. You're seeing it right uh, there. Excellent. So my question to you is whether this part here of the interferogram, which is dominated by I think uh, tropospheric is, is this too dense a coverage here? Of, it doesn't of... really look like it's selecting features. Um, yeah, well, the, could there's, you... there's different uh, methods for doing the quad tree um, downsampling. And this one is only looking at the local variance. And if there's a, a really uh, uh, intense uh, tropospheric variations, then sometimes it adds a lot of samples. But also the other thing that could happen is that you, uh, Snafu will unwrap the decorrelated areas and those will be extremely noisy. Yeah, so uh, very noisy. if those are not masked out, then they will dominate the sampling because they're high variance, basically on a short wavelength. You have all kinds of, all kinds of water <laughs> there. Yeah, so, you want to make sure you apply a water mask. Or at least a high correlation mask so that the water gets basically taken out. Okay. That's also, I think, the southern portion of the rupture, right? I see Christchurch there. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, yeah. The, the, bulk of, the, the bulk of the earthquake is further north, which is down on your... Yeah, so I had trouble with other stereo pairs. That's the only one that I really was able to fully process with Sentinel-1. So but you can see uh, there's all these uh, blobby uh, fringes out in the plains near near Christchurch that are almost sure that's the characteristic signature of tropospheric turbulence. And it's just something that it, the, the the this particular downsampling algorithm is ten, tends to pick up on that. OK, they will pick up even more, I think, on the on the decorrelation, which well, yeah. You you. There are there was another there was another um, a downsampling algorithm that uh, Rowena Lohman uh, developed a long time ago that actually uses a fault. You put in a fault plane that you're going to use for modeling, and it uh, selects the uh, samples that best imp, uh, image slip on that particular um, fault plane. That's called a fault based resampling, and uh, uh, the package that I use uh, called uh, CSI uh, does that uh, fault-based downsampling. It's, it works much better in cases like this where you have extraneous tropospheric noise. And also you know where the faults are. Yeah, you have to know where the fault is, <laughs> well, or, or at least approximation. And, and for the water mask, is there a repository of water masks, or should I just quickly cook one up here? Uh, there is a script called wbd.py, I think it is, that will create a water uh, body mask, which is basically the opposite of a, of a, of a land mask, which, which we use to mask out water. Um, but basically, if you can make, if you can get that to work, uh, crop it to the same size as your interferogram in terms of like the geographical extent um, there and then do some and load it into, into, into Python in, in using GDAL. Basically you just, you can use that to, to multiply your interferogram and mask yeah. out the thing. Um, and that's all that the water mask does in, in the quad tree notebook. Uh, if you have a, a file, which is ones and zeros where the land and water is then multiplying your, your interferogram by that will zero out all the water. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I have a hacky solution to the to the 
there used to be a script that did this um, within ICE, but I think it's been kind of non-functional for two or three years. Uh, something happened at the the server end where they were downloading data, and I guess no one updated the script to like to deal with it. Um, but yeah, they're they're all kind of workarounds and things that do still work, but there's no no neat solution yet. At some point, I guess I I shall upload the hacky solution I came up with to the internet somewhere. <laughs> But I haven't done that yet. It's, um, yeah. Sorry about that. Hey, okay. thanks. Uh, since we are already at the down sampling, I have a problem to sh to resolve. Uh, so I, I uh, try to down sample. Uh, the line of sight uh, displacement for Turkish event, you can see, and okay. I try to I try to uh, define the directory. Which uh, Turkey earthquake is this? A recent uh, Turkey Syria earthquake. Okay, I and, think that the phase for that is going to be complicated and difficult to sample, but yeah. But the problem here, I am encountering the problem. Uh, it does not, uh, it is not finding the band to the phase band. But is uh, it is it finding the file? Is probably the. I had the same problem, and I solved it by bringing the file into the directory here. You can give the full path to the directory that that contains the interferogram. Um, yeah, but uh, I am in this uh, directory already, uh, in the trial directory. Okay. But if I proceed, I can. Uh, I, I am encountering the same. I problem. think you need to put a forward slash on the end of your path. <laughs> uh, which one? Your IFG uh, path. Okay. The trial slash. Forward slash. Okay. Forward slash there. Because what it does to make the path to the file is it, it adds the two strings together. So if there's no slash after trial, it's not going to know that trial is a directory. Okay. Other slash. Forward slash. This one? Now try running it. I think the problem is that you you're you're in that trial directory, so that means that you don't need the path, the trial as part of the path. You might just put a dot slash. And then yeah, put a dot slash. That means don't add anything. Good point. Yeah, now I think it's locked. Yep. Oh, there it is. Oh. You have a, a signal. <laughs> Yeah. This looks like the Elizig earthquake of 2020, uh, 2021. It's the example one, yeah. OK, maybe I, I copy the another file. Well, anyway, um, yeah. the, the key is to make sure that the, the, the full path works mm -hmm. <laughs> to the file. And what, if you can get that to work, then all the rest of these things should work just fine with the interferograms anywhere on your on your system. It doesn't have to be in the current directory if you don't want it to be. Yeah, that really helps. Thanks. And uh, here, uh, regarding the fault lane, LM strike fault lane, uh -huh. uh, what should I consider? Uh, should I consider the actual uh, total fault lane or should I consider the fault lane within 
uh, my uh, image footprint. It's the length of the part of the fault that moved in the earthquake. So it's very closely related to the the spatial size of your deformation signal in terms of like how much area it takes up. So you would, in this case, you see there are positive and negative um, lobes in the deformation pattern that are, I eyeballed it about 35 kilometers long. Mm -hmm. And that's why 35,000 35, is the is the length guess that I used. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also gave it some bounds so that it can find it can fine tune the length in the inversion. Like, is it slightly longer? Is it slightly shorter? You don't have to be completely accurate with your first guess of the length, so long as your bounds are wide enough that 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 they can accommodate um, a range of different fault sizes. But but you basically get it by looking at the at the uh, down sample data and figuring out how approximately how long the uh, the area is that had has the deformation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes sense. Thanks, thanks for your suggestions. There's a question in chat about the King High earthquake, which is the other example that we shared. Um, some people have definitely have modeled it, so maybe one of those people could chime in and 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 answer Amrit's question here. Um, yeah, Amrit's question is he couldn't find the coherence information for that for that earthquake. actually not the chat it's the q a yeah it's the q a and i guess one of the things is that if someone submits a question the the rest of the class can't see it till it's answered is that right i think that's correct yeah okay so i pasted it into the chat <laughs> i tried for the king high earthquake i could get the result the needs to fine tune the parameters i couldn't find coherence layer with the downloaded data, did anyone try this data and find coherence too? I don't know what you mean by coherence in this case. It seems. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yep. Maybe yeah, so share, I your, think, yeah, maybe the, share the, your screen so everyone can see it in the video. Uh, Uh, can you see my screen? Yep. Yeah. So I mean, uh, so I, I, I downloaded data and then could not find uh, the coherence layer here. Uh -huh. And then we have used the threshold uh, to remove the the low coherent uh, signals in, in the code, right? Right. If you don't have the, the coherence, then you... You don't, you could just comment that part out. Yeah, I, I, I did that. That is why I, I was able to and, get the I did it, but yeah, I was interested to know how important it is to include the coherence layer. In an area like this, not very because it's very coherent. Uh -huh. um, okay. But yeah, the at, coherence is outstanding. <laughs> the issue really with what I'm seeing there is that there's two things. One is that your variance threshold is not low enough that that is not dividing up the 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 interferogram into 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 more highly focused areas. You have a uniform sampling somehow. Uh, the other thing is your model is not um, is not producing any slip. So the possibilities there are your fault isn't actually located within that area, like mm -hmm. in your in your bounds. Your your fault is in the wrong place, and so it's it's not actually producing a pattern that looks anything like the data yeah so, yeah i would go back and i would probably play a lot more with the the parameters for the, the quad tree uh to make sure that you actually do get a variation of of um sample uh what do they call them leaf sizes mm -hmm. and also um uh try and check double check the location of your fault 
Yeah, so uh, your your parameters were odd. Uh, not, I, I, not I, I run the default parameter because it could provide me the 216 leaves, right? But so, but it's a uniform sampling. It's uh -huh, just, okay. So it's not it's not distinguishing between high variance and low variance areas. Everything seems to be sampled by the same um patch size. Uh, okay. And there's definitely there's definitely more detail than that in the interferogram that's not being captured. So you might make your yeah. your minimum patch size um or your maximum patch size larger, I think perhaps. And your yeah, variant, so, and your variance uh, smaller. Yeah, I I will modify this and then run. Yeah, thank you. Then for coordinates, use that UTM meters, not from this map. Yeah, you have to look mm -hmm. at the the geographical coordinates. So if you go okay. to your your forward model notebook again, mm -hmm. um, look at the the. the just the plot of the, the data in the model, say. You can see in your in the left panel, the, the, the deformation pattern is located at like 700,000 meters X and I don't know, 41, 80, 90 yeah. times 10 to the three. <laughs> so that's a seven digit number <laughs> that should be in meters. So if your fault isn't located somewhere near there, then you won't see it in your forward model. And probably what the forward model is is doing is just um, you're just seeing some um, uh, attempt. If this is an inversion result, the attempt by the model to like put uh, as much slip as it can on on the fault so that something appears on your on your plot. But that won't yeah. happen if the fault is actually located within that area. Then you'd see a pattern that's just centered on on your fault location. Yeah. 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 I will modify it. Yeah, thanks. Uh, we have time for one more question. I see Haresh is in the room, so he's he's going to speak next. So, um, uh, yeah, uh, if I may, I would you like may? to show you uh, my ongoing work regarding the the modeling. Sure. Uh, so. so... Okay. Okay. Uh, it's about this uh interprogram I showed uh last uh, Thursday. Yeah. Uh, Wednesday. Yes, I don't remember. Um. Yeah, about the large like intrusion and at Edna volcano. Mm -hmm. So I'm not pretty sure about the 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 sampling the sub sampling um i got this so you've masked out quite a, a lot bit, of i'm sure so you're using probably you could try lowering the threshold of your correlation mask uh because it's masking out some of your signal uh so that's a number somewhere near the top uh ah, here yeah so try a lower number like 0. 0.2 just to see what that does okay i think so you need to load the inter quickly yeah. yeah you do need to reload the interferogram Okay. Yeah, it's a little bit better. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for that. And then, yeah, I'm working on that on the modeling, but of course with this other threshold value. And I think it's not enough with this source to resolve this uh this so are you, this deformation. Are Maybe you just to check, are you using the tensile version of this? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you found that then, because <laughs> I didn't tell anyone where it was. Sorry, could, could you repeat? Are you using the tensile version of, of ACADA? 
Like, uh, yeah, so yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm working with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm just trying with some parameters. Yeah. But I see rake. Are yeah. You sure, that you're is... using what? Ah, you. Ah, okay. Yeah, in this case, it shouldn't. I shouldn't have any rake. If you're Parameter. using the version which does diking, <laughs> um, maybe okay, you should maybe I'm, message I'm me on message me on Slack and I will find the version of the notebook that actually does this with um, uh, with with the right version of Vicada to do opening on Dyke. Because if if you're using the version that does fault slip, then you're going to get wacky answers. Yeah. Uh... It's it's as you see. The first line of the dependencies in import rect rectangular shear fault. There is a version that will do tensile dislocation, but that is not this version of the notebook. Okay. Okay. Uh, and as I say, send me a Slack message, and I will point you to like a okay. an interferogram okay. to use. <laughs> okay. Great. I would do that. Okay. Thank you. And I will work on the threshold value. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, wait. Okay, we've made yeah. it to ten thirty. Um, Haresh is here. He has a a, a demo for us, or or a, or a presentation on on the, the ice of the future. The yeah. future is about to start. It's going to be very exciting. Um, and he's going to tell us about the future of ice. Yeah, sorry, I don't I don't have a demo. Actually, we could have a demo if there is time, but uh, I have few slides. Just um, I thought I thought that is the idea. So that was the idea. Paul was like saying, "Well, we should do a demo," and then, okay. but I don't I don't have time to do it. <laughs> hey, Russ should do it. <laughs> All right, let's see. Let's see if we have time, and let's see what I have. I'm not prepared for that, but yeah, we could. All right, so let's see. Um, Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. So I'm gonna talk about uh, introducing ICE three, uh, the new the new software, not really the new version because ICE three itself has many versions already. We are at version zero point fourteen, I believe. Um, and um, what what I would like to call it is. Uh, um, in star scientific computing environment enhanced sorry enhanced uh, edition and that's that's ice uh, and that uh, we have three triple e's there so that three stands for that just just trying to say that it's not simply a new version of ice 2 it's really um, a, a complete rewrite starting from scratch so it's a new software and yeah of course a big team is working on um, has been working on the software um, and uh, I would like to acknowledge the team and their contributions um, uh, to, to, to ICE 3. So uh, similar to ICE 2, ICE 3 is an open source library for processing uh, SAR data. Uh, obviously a successor to the uh, ICE 2 and it is a ground up, ground up redesign really. Uh, um, focusing on improved modularity, documentation, and test-driven development. So, um, uh, despite ICE two, where you know we have a lot of legacy codes, uh, codes from Boypack, uh, colleagues from JPL have written. I don't know in thirty years ago. Here, of course, we we took a lot of algorithms there, but um, those core Fortran codes were well written to uh, with, with C++. And uh, the driver for um, the development, it was originally started from a small project, AIST, and then it has been NICER, heavily NICER. Um, so basically, um, it's going to be the ground processor software for, uh, for NICER. I will I will um, clarify a little bit more what is gonna do for NICER. And um, recently we have uh, adopted some workflows 
that we had developed for NICE are adapted for Sentinel-1. I will clarify those. So the core modules are written in C++. Uh, for some modules where we were hoping to see um, speed up, we have actually some CUDA implemented. And uh, the main speed up is for focusing. For NICER, we are using a uh, state-of-the-art, very precise focusing algorithm, back projection algorithm, and that's very expensive to run. Um, unless if you write it on GPU. So that was the main reason, but there are a couple of other modules also written on, on GPU. So all those modules, um, uh, we have uh, wrappers and we have bindings um, to expose to Python. And uh, that's where you can use i3 as a, as a Python library. Inside i3, since we have, um, since NICER has been the driver, we have, of course, a NICER package there, but uh, at the workflow level and um, pretty much separate from, from, from the core modules and the core library of the IS3. Uh, the, what are the low level functionalities? We have geometrical computations. Um, I'm sure in the last few days, uh, my colleagues have talked about forward mapping, inverse mapping, going from Going from radar to geo and from geo, geo coordinates coming back to the radar coordinates. Um, those transformations that we use regularly in many different workflows. So those are there and very um, easily exposed to the users if, if advanced users want to play with the core modules themselves. There is geodetic transformations, there is interpolation, different kinds, convolution, FFT computations and some convenience classes and objects that we need to build the higher level workflows. We use those core uh, functionalities to build core modules. We have image formation as a module. We have geometrical offsets computations. That's what we need for core registration. Image matching for cross correlation, pixel offset tracking and all that. Uh, Geocoding modules. Um, and uh, radiometric terrain correction, uh, something that we have some prototypes in ICE2, but really not was not the focus. We have some strong core modules here for radiometric terrain correction for ICE3. Um, and yeah, of course, interferon formation, phase unwrapping, a couple of different algorithms. And all those then flow into different workflows, which uh, um, for NICER, we have different products. I will talk about those products um, a little bit. RSLC, ranged after single or complex image. Um, we have geocoded SLC, geocoded covariance, which is that radiometric terrain corrected RTC images. Uh, we have INSAR, a couple of INSAR products, um, geocoded unwrapped interferograms will be global. For NICER and there is uh, pixel offsets over cryosphere regions. And then uh, recently, uh, um, um, NASA has, of course, uh, asked us through OPERA project in JPL to uh, process some Sentinel-1 data for some downstream um, downstream products, global and national. Um, but to get there, we need to we needed to basically adapt some of these workflows for Sentinel-1 working. And that's that has been very exciting. The modularity of the software made this development very efficient. Here is an example. We have core functionalities like geo to RDR, going from geo to radar. We have interpolation, we have orbit manipulation. And then we have the core module, GeoCode SLC. And we had a workflow, NICER GeoCode SLC workflow. All we had to do was to get that to work for Sentinel-1. So really with uh, with minimal work, pretty much, um, we were able to get this to work for Sentinel-1 as well. Um, since I mentioned the NICER has been the driver, uh, I wanted to just uh, very quickly tell you about what is coming for NICER. We have the raw data coming to to us and then um, the first product that we will generate is the range Doppler single or complex images. And then we have in radar coordinates, we have the pixel offsets, um, in, um, range Doppler interferograms wrapped and unwrapped over cryosphere regions. 
And then we have a bunch of geocoded products globally. We have geocoded covidiums, again, that radiometric terrain corrected, geocoded SLC. We have uh, offsets, geocoded offsets, and geocoded unwrapped interferograms. These are going to be produced operationally and uh, globally, all those geocoded products plus the ranged up for uh, single or complex images. Some examples that with ICE-3, we take, um, um, you know, we, we can produce strange Doppler SLCs with simulated data. Of course, the mission is not launched, fingers crossed next year. Geocoded SLC uh, is the geocoded version of the SLCs. And then for this RTC or GCOF products, where you see that we have the terrain usually in the backscatter of the SAR, but uh, for some uh, applications, we would like to just uh, flatten out topography so you will get some flattened backscatter that then you can interpret for, for your different applications. And then interferograms and offset tracking. Um, so the uh, for I3, again, um, um, we, we have some short-term, long-term goals. And uh, yes, as I mentioned, the driver has been NICER, so we are supporting NICER. And recently the Opera project, there are other projects like MAP we are um, supporting, and there are wish lists. And part of that wish list are you in this course, the, the science community, uh, because we know that uh, we have a big user community for ICE2, and uh, I'm sure uh, there is um, interest to, to continue using the software and the new generation, with, which is ICE3. We are aware and we are working towards that. Um, uh, we are committed to the open science uh, initiative from NASA, and that's really our hope is that that, that path will will allow us to support this community, which uh, some of them are in this course today. All right, so what is um, um, uh, the tools that we have? We don't have NICER yet. I'm sure many of you are interested in Sentinel-1. That's where we get um, data now and a lot of them. So I'm sure you guys are um, uh, wondering what is available right now as of today to use ICE-3 for Sentinel-1. Well, um, recently um, through the Opera project, we were able to develop some tools for Sentinel-1 processing with ICE-3. We have the Sentinel-1 reader. Um, so that's that's the reader. And then we have the uh, one software called Compass for geocoding Sentinel-1 SLCs. And we have another one uh, for um, uh, radiometric terrain correction of the Sentinel-1 data. So those are actually very mature. We are at the final delivery. Next week, we have the final delivery of those software for the Opera project, but they are open source. They are available to everybody. It's um, basically ICE3 based tools and everybody can use. Um, the We have other tools that is under development uh, my colleague Scott Stenowitz have been working on suites, um, a very high level workflow that puts together um, different tools that we have in IS3 to make interferograms from geocoded SLCs. It's not mature yet, but it's working. People are welcome to give it a try if they want to. The algorithm is different from what you saw in Pops app. It's based on geocoding the SLCs and then making interferograms. And then um, we have uh, Tofu, another software that we are working on for phase unwrapping in multi-resolution. Those are heavily, heavily under development. But yeah, the mature tools are available. Where is ICE 3? Well, it's on public GitHub. Um, and uh, it's also uh, possible to install just using uh, Conda. Uh, you can just say Conda install dash C Conda forge ICE 3, and you should be able to get the latest version. The other tools are also uh, either on GitHub or um, already on Conda. Um, there is i3, there is Sentinel-1 reader, there is Compass, and there is RTC. And uh, uh, most of them are available through Conda. RTC is not, but it's very easy to install just from the source, the RTC one, if anybody wants to. Uh, just what, what they would do, uh, since I doubt if in this course, um, 
I'm not sure actually if uh, my colleagues talked about the RTC, but here's the backscatter that we have all the topography. It's Sentinel-1 processed with ICE-3, and this is after RTC correction. So the, the impact of topography basically is removed from the backscatter. We were recently able actually to um, scale over the globe, our data system and the Opera project um, for a test. They scaled globally and here is a nice mosaic of all those products for each zip file that we get from safe file from, uh, from uh, Sentinel-1. We produce the geocoded RTC products for each burst. So it, for this example, it's one cycle. We had a lot of around 270,000 products were produced and then mosaic and um, here is the image. For CSLC, um, we are geocoding also the same. We, we take one save file, we geocode it uh, underground and we always geocode to the same boundary so you can make interferogram just by simply cross multiplying. Um, here is one example that each of the bursts are geocoded separately and making interferograms and stitch them for um, bridge crest earthquake, you see that it's actually working. And um, of course, I already talked about the geocoded SFC. And here is an example that we uh, scaled again over North America. Uh, again, through Opera project, we uh, um, scale the ice three bait Sentinel one uh, geocoding SLC, and here's a mosaic of all the burst level geocoded SLCs over the North America. So, uh, uh, next few months, um, we are marching towards our launch version of the software for NISAR. So, that hopefully reduces some pressure on the team, and then we can get to the more detailed documentations for the core modules um, for ICE-3. Uh, this community should be interested in that. Examples for workflow users, um, similar to what you saw in this course, we hope that we will have enough examples that then we will eventually have a course for ICE-3 as well. And then uh, user-friendly NICER readers um, um, for, for NICER specific product. And yeah, that um, workflow making into suites, making it different from, from geocode resources. We we hope that that will be tested enough, matured, and uh, available to the users. Actually, it's on the ICE framework already, and people can try, but we don't guarantee that it's super mature. Long term goal is that uh, we would uh, like to add support for historical sensors. Um, um, uh, we would like to have equivalent of TOPS app and strip map in i3 and uh, more uh, robust CI is, is, is the key to, to keep going and to, to um, uh, maintain the software and to uh, basically support the community. So that's all I have on the slides. Um, yeah, and it looks like I'm right at the top of the hour. Right on time. <laughs> Any, any any questions? Uh, looks like there are some questions, right? Or in the chat. This is this is Tarek Amalong. I have a question, Harris. Um, <laughs> so the Sentinel One products, they are all um, from Ice Three. They are all ionospheric corrected. Uh, no, Sentinel-1 products. Okay, so which product are you talking about? The uh, Geocoded Geo SSEs. Oh, uh, for geolocation, yes, they are ionosphere corrected. They will be ionosphere corrected. So basically we are using the um, tech data to precisely geolocate the, um, uh, the um, uh, burst SLCs. So in that sense, yes, but we are not touching the phase. So if you would geocode the SLCs, the geolocation is correct as much as the um, GNSS tech allows you. And uh, our evaluation seems that the geolocation is fine, but then the phase is there. So if you make an interferogram out of those, the phase, uh, ionospheric phase is there. 
the ionosphere effects is in the in the in the SLC in the SLC, you mean. So so is then there information coming with the product what we can use to remove it from the um from the geocoded SLC? No, no, we still no, that's not that's not that. Because each SLC is processed individually, there's no way to do the split spectrum estimation. That's right, yeah. Yes, okay, thank you. <laughs> any, any other questions? Well, that's actually a question for uh, the NISAR uh, geocoded SLCs. Those are not... And those are also going to be corrected for by for this TEC geolocation error, but they're not going to include the uh, a split spectrum estimation. Yeah, so exactly. So the the for geocoded SLCs, the important thing is to geolocate precisely. And for NISAR, um, the phase is a different story. So for NISAR, the nice thing is we are going to geocode both main band and side band SLCs, and then the users can make interferograms and make interferograms of main band and side band, and then do the same ionospheric phase estimation that Eric has talked about for the strip map. But in this case, for NISAR, we don't need to split the spectrum. The, the yeah, it's already split. <laughs> so that's, um, there is a good possibility there for estimating ionosphere. Any other questions? Yes, so yeah, I see that uh, some people are, uh, Alejandra, they are excited about working directly with the burst. Yes, so we, uh, the whole geocoding SLCs and RTC, um, we are uh, working directly with the bursts. So we built on the burst database from ESA and we have fixed the bounding box and all that. And the products that Opera is gonna produce actually go to the ASF, the, they are burst products. So you can just pull each of those products. If you want only one burst, you can pull one burst. And the tools that we have developed actually the same. If you have one save file and you know you can you can determine which burst IDs are there and process only one burst. Um, so that's that's more convenient, I would say, and uh, cleaner. Uh, Farah says, would you be willing to speak a bit about the development status of the suites in SAR package? Yeah, for us, uh, Forest suites have been really uh, just uh, for testing. Um, um, I think it's pretty much there. Um, Scott has been uh, the developer there. Uh, so just taking the geocoded SLCs, make the interferograms, teach them, unwrap them, and that's what it does right now. What it doesn't do is all those fancy ionosphere-related stuff um, that we have in TOPS app. We don't have it in suites. And that's that's a little bit challenging to do in geocoded SLCs. So there is a little bit work to be done there. Sounds good. Thanks. Yeah. Sure. And tofu is that supposed to be uh, to supersede snafu? Uh, tofu is a higher level um, workflow on algorithms. The idea is that uh, we would uh, use um, existing uh, tools like snafu, and we rewrote uh, ICU that's inside ICE three. So if you have a very coherent interferogram, actually that runs super fast. Um, and then there is another tool that um, SWAT was developed for SWAT mission that's also part of, part of IS3 called the uh, FAS. Um, so the idea is that in Tofu, we, we would use those core unwrappers, but, um, but at multi-resolution. Uh, so to, and also in, with, with tiling. So speeding up and getting a little bit better quality unwrapping. But uh, the core unwrappers are the existing tools. Only 2D or also 3D? It's 2D for now. At least the current project, we have only 2D. Thank you. Okay. There was a question about when the uh, products were going to be released from Opera. 
Uh, I believe the production, the current plan is uh, October. It will start sometime in October. So the hopefully- The registered SLCs. Yes, the um, registered SLCs, which is the basically Geocode Sentinel-1 SLC and RTC. So that's the-, the uh, Displacement products? Displacement products are gonna be next year. Our final delivery to the project is sometime, sometime next September, I believe. Well, if there are no further questions, and thank Haresh for this exciting vision of what's to come. Um, and maybe we can take a five minute break uh, before Yunjun takes over and shows us all the world of mint pie. So back at the hour, if you, just a short break. Um, Thanks Haresh. Thanks, Suresh. See you around. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone. Um, so next on the agenda is Mint Pie. Uh, Yun Jun is here somewhere. I see his name on the list. Maybe you could uh, take over and maybe start with a short introduction to yourself. I don't know if you actually have introduced yourself to everybody. Yeah, Gareth, uh, thank you. Do you hear me? Yes. Great. Let me first maybe try to share my screen. Um, okay. Um, make this open. Uh, so do you, is my size of the of the is my font size looks good? It does. Great. Um. So hello everyone. I'm Yun Jun. Um. I'm currently an associate professor at Chinese Academy of Sciences. Um. So, and I've been working on Insta a lot. I got my PhD from University of Miami. Um. I think that's it. I previously worked a lot of on the INSAR time series analysis. So, um, so today we will try the INSAR time series analysis uh, with MinPy and using the ARIA products that we have tried in the last few days as the input of the time series analysis. Uh, just a very short background on MinPy. It's an open source package for the time series analysis. It was started as a student project uh, by Haresh in, during his time in University of Miami, then by me, and then nowadays it has been really contributed and maintained by many people around the world for more than 30 developers, which is really greatly appreciated. And that really makes it uh, maintainable in the long term. You can find the code on GitHub here and uh, the detailed algorithms implemented in the MinPy code. Uh, you can find that on this uh, paper also. And the and the data for the paper for the paper is also available publicly on GitHub uh, on Zenodo. Uh, you can find a link here. Um, so MinPy is uh, implementation of the distributed scatterer algorithms. If you remember that from Harish's presentation on Wednesday. Um, so, and more specifically is implementing the small baseline algorithm for the DS approach. And the in terms of the detail, in, ter in terms of the practical format, MinPa is primarily consistent with the stack of inferograms processed with ICE2. Uh, however, the software also support the inferograms processed with other INSA processors such as Gamma, GMTSR, Snap, RIPAC, and also support the inferogram database uh, produced by ARIA, ASF's HyP3 services, etc. So today we will so today we will um, split the MinPy session into two main parts. 
first we will go through the general overview and then with a very quick uh, demo on the time series analysis. And in the next session, we will talk more about the error analysis, which is actually my favorite part. So before we go further, wow, that's me. I think it's my brother thing. Let me just uh, stop sharing and then open another one. I think I see this before. I'll, I'll be back in 10 seconds. Anyone give me a thumbs up or voice? Do you see my new screen? Looks Great. good. Great, thank you. So let's first uh, just around this shell, run this cell first. Uh, also note that you may you want to change your kernel to the Earthscope Insar. Then let's just run this cell. Before you run for this one first. Okay, and then we run the second one. Okay, so let me explain what it's doing. Um, we will first just um, warm up the import all the functions and modules we needed. And then the your current data, your current working directory is on this directory on your home. And you will see that you will generate a folder right in your home directory data here. And currently it's on the second cell, it's trying to download a pre-staged data set from ARIA that I prepared beforehand and uh, unzip them so that we can use them for time series analysis. Maybe take like three minutes to finish, I think. And uh, later words, after the class, if you want to if you want to run this again, you can try. And if you don't have access to the AWS, uh, or if you prefer, you can change this one to Zenodo. The same data set is also available on Zenodo. So you can just try it here, uh, change it to Zenodo here, and then rerun it. And if you want to prepare the everything yourself, here is the exact command that I used to produce this pre-staged data set. So you can do that also. Please let know if anyone has problem on the slot on the on the chat. So this is a, a real data set. So it's from Sentinel One and the data set is on San Francisco Bay in California. And it's a uh, interfere grant stack for about um, from 2014 to 2022, I believe. So, and then let's go further. Um, so the main workflow or script that we're using today is called the small baseline app. So it's similar to the tops app or strip map app that we've been processing, we've been using in this class. Uh, it's basically a workflow that implements the small baseline approach for the time series analysis. The input of this is a stack of unwrapped inferograms, and the output would be uh, in SAR time series. So it's a 3D, uh, 2D in space, and 1D in time. And the main thing is uh, the whole workflow is described here. It mainly includes uh, two blocks. The first one is this is this one in blue is done is all the operations in the inferogram domain. Uh, so basically like um, modifying the network of the inferograms, selecting a reference point for every inferograms and then trying to correct some face unwrapping errors. I'll explain what is that later words and then do a time series uh, estimation or network inversion on the network of inferograms into the time series. And then all the other correct, all the other operations we apply in the second block 
all of them in the green are based on the INSAR tensile analysis. And I will explain why we split that in the second session also. And uh, you can see in this main workflow, some of them are, um, are having the dashed boundaries and these are operate optional steps. And uh, the whole workflow can be uh, controlled through a configuration file, uh, which is this file called smallbaselandapp.cfg file. If you click here, it will take you to GitHub. Um, so you can find everything here and uh, all the op all the options has um all the options has the are uh, initiated with an default auto value and later words are uh, on the comments it will show you what the default value is with the potential format for the for the option for the with the potential values for the option also and you can see it's actually pretty long so uh which is uh which is which is a bad thing, but it's also a very good thing, so that you can really um, fine tune all your fine tune all your parameters to make MinPy doing whatever you like. Let's see. So my first part finished. Uh, is is everyone else having having their first set, having this downloading finished? Could you give me a a text to respond on the chat. Great. Great. So you can um you can see that um the usage of small baseline app is very similar to the tops app. So if you click the minus minus help, it will show you the help message. And uh, you can see that it breaks down the whole workflow into a lot of steps. That's very similar to the TOPS app also. And uh, I will show you exactly what those steps means in a, in a few seconds. Be be besides, you run the TOPS app like that, and then you can also do the, the, do the step processing um, by specifying the starting step or the ending step to run the specific step that you like, or you can do a single step processing using this do step option. Here is some example uses that you will see that you might try to use in your later uh, in your own processing. The main work the main steps are mainly this part. The input is called load data. It basically load all the stack up infograms, including the unwrapped phase the special coherence and the connected component, which is a byproduct from um, from Snafu and from other things from other unwrappers from IS2 also. I'm sure you have using that in the earlier in the in the course. Plus some geometry files, including the height, the instance angle of the loss vector, the azimuth angle of the loss vector, and the lookup tables, which is used for geocoding. Into uh, in this step. MinPy will load all of them into HDL5 files. And uh, then later words, um, with the first part, which is, was earlier the blue, the blue part doing everything for in the filograms, including the modified network. Uh, if you remember, we have a network of in the filograms. So we can choose which pairs of in the filograms to use for all the ana analysis later words. And the reference point is because uh, the the unwrapped phase, we want all the unwrapped phase in time have, uh, have the exact same special reference consistently so that we can do a time, series, a time an, an analysis in time. A uh, useful step is called quick overview, which will generate some quick assessment of the time series data set, include, including a simple stacking, which is a technique for tensors analysis also developed around 30 years ago, uh, even though it's very simple, but it's actually very powerful. And the second part is somehow useful, um, somehow generate a product, which is very useful to check, to detect the unwrapping errors, which is also one of the main error sources for INS for time analysis. And you can later work correct for this error and invert that. And in the second part is the noise, is the noise reduction or error corrections. As you now know that there are many error sources in, in, in INSAR, 
including the troposphere, ionosphere, DEM error, et cetera. And then a lot of them will be corrected uh, in the second stage. And then you can, after you get a final product, you can output that into the GIS tools or modeling tools that you like, and all of them will be covered in the output part. So the controlling parameters or the processing parameters, uh, there are two of them in, in there are two of them in the small baseline app. One is one is the default configuration with a file name called this, and this contains all the configurations group, group by steps with a default value always. And this is copied over to the working directories and read every time whenever the small baseline app runs. And this this text file is more for the for the program to run for the programs. Uh, another one is called a uh, customized uh, custom configuration, which is optional, but always recommend, but I highly recommend it. And uh, I treat this one more for the configuration for the humans, for us. So that is usually much shorter. And the logic is that it can contains a selectively manually modified configuration parameters so that the whenever and this custom template will have a higher priority than the default template. So if you run the program with the custom template, the code will update the default template based on that. So we will always override the default template based on the custom configuration so that you can easily keep track, uh, keeping these two configuration in sync. Okay, so let's uh, run the next one. It's basically writing a configuration file. In this case, for now, we are just using, specifying the processing, pro the, the inside processors. In this case is ARIA. You can specify that you can, you can use uh, ICE, ARIA, HIB3 from SF, GMT, et cetera, as I said before, it support all of them. And this is one of the uh, examples for ARIA. And uh, we come in this first initial round, we only specify one simple uh, one simple option to for the reference point. All the others I turned it off and I will turn them on later words to show the effect of these options. So let's first get a quick question. Uh, we know that the input of MinPy is a stack of interferograms. And uh, are the multiple pairs of interferograms produced by TOPS app a stack of interferograms? Basically saying that uh, is the default output if you run TOPS app many times, you can generate many pairs of interferograms by default. Is this output can be used directly for MinPy? Uh, let's see your answer on the chat, please. Uh, basic, uh, basically yes or no, I think. If you have no, maybe, or yes, give your reasons. Great, I see, I see one, I see one person. Right, great. Uh, so the the answer yes. The great. The answer is no. The answer is no, not yet. The answer is no. Uh, because as Kate said, uh, the interferograms needs to be aligned. That's what we call the stack of interferograms. We mean all the interferograms, each pixel, they should be aligned in space so that they're consistent. Uh, right. So that's basically that. And uh, you can find more examples on the on on this template options for different inside processors down in the link here. If you click, it will bring you to the documentation of MinPy. This is one of the best friends you may want to have when you're using or learning MinPy. So you can see here uh, there are many directories direct there are many examples for the directory structures that you would expect when you use uh, different processors. And because the corresponding template options for the input uh, for different processes is also given right next to it. 
Okay, so let's go ahead for the next step. Let's first just do the loading. I believe I have already loaded uh, so that this will run super fast. It basically says it's already loaded and then you don't need to reload anymore. And then let's see the output of the loading step of the load data. You can see that it generates an input folder with some of the files here. First is the geometry file. And the second is the Nefugran stack, including the unwrapped phase coherence and the kinetic components. It also copies over the configuration, the two configuration files for backup purposes. And the Nefugran stack, you can see that uh, it, can, it, can, it contains the following uh, data set. The three of them, the unwrapped phase co co coherence, are all in 3D with this size, and M is the number of Nefugrams. And you can see, um, and since I know many many of you may not be familiar with the H5 file, uh, it's actually a very standard file format. And you can check the file data, the file structure using a program minpy called import.py. And you can run import.py on any ice2 or minpy files and will produce and it will let you know the data structures and metadata within the file like this. So you can see that um, the geometry file has a lot of attributes in the root level. For example, this one is the, the number of multi-looking in the Atmos direction, which is seven, et cetera. And then at the bottom, it will show you the data, the data structure of this file. In this case, we have the many, many angles, the height and water mask also. You can run this for the Infugrant stack also here. We'll give you a similar structure but in different data set. So before we do the uh, the next step, before we do the inversion, is actually is usually useful to plot the Infugram network to see how your network looks like. And you can do that uh, using a code, using a script called plot network in MinPy. Uh, what it does is um, what it does is it's reading it's reading the special coherence of the Infugram stack and then calculate an average special coherence value for each pair and write that into a txt file, which is this, this file right here. And then you will, based on that, plot, plot a lot of several figures to show you how your network looks like. The first figure is uh, the perpendicular baseline history, well, the, this, this, what, which is the y-axis here. The x-axis is in time. So you can see that Sentinel-1 has a really, really tight um, orbital tube and the majority of the perpendicular baseline is within minus 50 to 50 meters, which is really nice for INSAR. The second one is a coherence history. What it shows is actually, again, uh, x-axis is time, y-axis is, is, is the average special coherence. And each bar actually represents the blue and the orange represents the minimum and maximum special coherence among all the infograms for that one acquisition that involved. So that usually, so the useful thing is, for example, for this acquisition at this time, you can see that is maximum. Uh, so you can see that among all the infograms that has this date, the, it's the, the maximum coherence is also not super high, like around like a little bit over 0.6. So you can know that there may be some quality issue or this state just uh, has bad coherence among all the pairs. So you may want to consider uh, drop this acquisition if you like. And actually for a maximum coherence of 0.6 is actually pretty good. But occasionally you will see some acquisitions will have even the maximum, the, basically the blue line, the blue bar below 0.4. And in that case, those those states are really bad, and you may really consider just want to remove them from your time series analysis. The next uh, figure is this one. It's the called the coherence matrix. You can see that from here. Um, the coherence matrix. The both the x and y axis are the image number, so that here each grid represent one in a few grams and the color of the grid represents the average special coherence for that in a few gram. 
And you can see, of course, then when it's in the diagonal line, uh, it's basically in the field ground from the same image, so which is uh, meaningless. So that's why uh, we put a black color here and but everything off the diagonal line represents the actual spatial coherence. And you can see basically that uh, we have a lot of small baseline pairs, plus we have an, a lot of pairs around this part, which is uh, around uh, 30 connections, because this, for example, this one, this grid, is the inferior between the first pair, between the first acquisition, and around the 15th acquisition. And this one is actually around with a temporal, with a, with a sequential collection of around 30. This is around a sequential connection of 15. We can see the exact same uh, information right in this figure also, which you may have seen that many times. Now in this case, the y-axis is the spatial perpendicular baseline. So one dot represents one acquisition and one line connecting two dots represents one in the field graph. And the color again represents the average spatial coherence. So you can see that a lot of small temporal baseline in the field grams has high spatial coherence, while the long temporal baseline in the field ground has low spatial coherence. And it, and it means that for this data set, the decorrelation is actually dominated by the temporal decorrelation, not the spatial decorrelation, because Sentinel-1 has a, such a tight, uh, small spatial, spatial perpendicular baseline. So the spatial decorrelation is very limited. Okay, um, besides the net, besides the network, another useful thing is many different type of masks or quality parameters. One of them is the special, one of them is the average spatial coherence. And this is, um, let me plot, let's plot and see it here. So this average spatial coherence is uh, average in time. So each pixel here, uh, the value of each, each pixel here represents the average spatial coherence in time. So uh, you can see that in the Bay Area, a lot of this part, uh, the bright colors uh, represent very high coherence. Of course, the black part is, is water, which is maxed out. And uh, we can see in the mountain regions, with a lot of low spatial coherence. We can also generate a water mask, as can show, see shown here. And the third one is what I call the common kinetic component. As you may now know that the kinetic com connected component, the byproduct from SNAFU or from face unwrapping is actually a very valuable parameters for analysis. So one of the useful thing is among all the kinetic components in, in all the interferons, we in this case is calculating the pixels that has valid connected component information among all interferograms. So you would imagine that the pixels selected by this file has good unwrapped face information among all interferograms, which is actually used later words as a reference or as a base to select the special reference point. So let's see if there's any questions on the chat. Right, I know they have been answered. All right, so this is the output of that. We can see basically that the spatial pattern of this uh, mimics is very similar to the average spatial coherence we have here, which is reasonable. And the next step before we do the inversion is the spatial referencing or select to the reference point because um, the INSAR is a relative measure. So everything, so the in the field metric phase is relative in time, relative by nature. Um, so we have to find a reference point uh, among all the interferons to make the spatial referencing consistent. 
And the and this step is actually usually a manual step, one of the few steps in MinPy that is manual, um, because the spatial referencing is actually a relatively tricky thing. You want it to be coherent among all the interferograms. You want it has a valid face information around all the interferograms. And then you want it, you want your special reference point is close to your area or signal of interest. There are some rules of general of how to select a good reference point. We will show that later words. Uh, it's written out, right? It's written out in your template in MinPy's uh, configuration files. I will show that later words. Let's just first run it. So you can see that. Um, so you can see that it, when we run this, it generates, uh, it's run a few more scripts. Before that, uh, it's looking for this, it's looking for this common kinetic component file, which is already exist. It's looking for the average spatial coherence, which is already exist. Otherwise it will generate them by default. Uh, so, and in this step, instead of really referencing or changing the face in MinPy, uh, the code is actually just putting a uh, metadata in the file and then re-referencing it on the fly whenever it's need, whenever the special referencing is needed so that it can be faster. And you can see that uh, in earlier, we choose a reference point based on the latitude longitude. It's finding that here and it's also finding the corresponding row and column number or the ref X and Y here. So now we have everything ready. Let's just uh, run the uh, let's just run the network inversion. It should be relatively fast. So let's explain this. Uh, the this is the this 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 step is the implementation of the classic S pass algorithm, or more strictly the small baseline algorithm, because it assumes usually no subsets, because the S pass, the last S is actually originally means subsets. And nowadays, uh, since the since nowadays since the since the temporal sampling of the SAR data set of the SAR satellite are so good. We rarely have subsets anymore. We should and easily get a fully connected network of interferograms so that we don't need to assume a subset. Because assuming subsets, when we do the inversion, we apply extra constraints um, and which will actually bias our estimated time series. And we don't want that. Let's see. And then the estimated time series is, uh, in, since this, after this step, the estimate time series or the displacement measure is converted in MinPy into meters, uh, into meters from, from the unit of radians into meters. And also in that, since this step, the positive value of the time series uh, indicates motions of the ground towards the satellite. So if it's a pure vertical motion, uh, the positive value of, of the time series since this step means uplift and the negative value means substance. Okay, it's running. Let's see the, let's see some questions. So Zenep asks, uh, is uh, if our reference point is in the subsiding or uplifting area, does this affect the results? Yes, and uh, especially if that subside, if, especially if that uh, subsiding or uplifting area is your signal, and your study your area of interest, you want to choose a reference point outside of it, and you want to you must still want to keep it close. But but that but definitely outside of it. And 
another question is what does it mean to have several different connected component group and how to interpret it? Uh, we will show one example later words um, on the next session uh, on, on that. Usually the different kinetic component group uh, output by SNAFU, it usually means there may be potentially unwrapping errors between them, but potentially, because uh, SNAFU basically just calculated the parameter. And then if it's not confident that the two kinetic the two the, the two kinetic component are free from unwrapping error then it will mark them and separate them differently. So yeah, so it usually means potentially there, there's an RPN error, but not always. Um, another question for better results, should we increase the special stress on the coherence value, coherence level? Um, no need. Uh, we use the so far we've been using the special coherence just for the quality checking. We're not really applying any threshold using based on special coherence. Which we will show that later words. Uh, right away, right after this, we'll show that we're actually using temporal coherence, and then setting a threshold there, and we'll show you why later words. If you want another question is, if you want to specify your reference point manually rather than using the default approach, how do you do that? Uh, you can do that either in lat unknown or in X and Y, uh, up to you. Uh, either of them will work. Um, and it is through the template option in the very beginning right here. This is how we specify it using this option. Okay, so our this step finished. Let's just see the result of this step. Uh, could you could, could people show that does that finished for you? Or are you on the process of getting the result? Yes, no? On the chat, please. So the output of this step is the time series file h 5 file, um, and we can see again using info the py. Great, I see many people has their result. Great. Uh, if you run this step, you can see that this time series file has these again many attributes or metadata in the root level, which gives the same, which gives the similar metadata or should be actually exactly the same metadata as the infrequent stack. And that in terms of data set, it has three data sets. First is the perpendicular special baseline. It's a 1D matrix. Second is a date. Uh, it's a stream. Uh, it's another 1D matrix. And then the third one is a time series data set, which is a 3D matrix with the first one in time and the later two in space. So, and then we can just plot it and see, and see how it looks like. In MinPy, the main plotting script or command it's called view the py, and then you can we can run that in notebook in this way, or if you prefer in terminal later words after the class, you can run that in this way, uh, which is uh, which is another script, um, yeah. And let's see, uh, you can see that when it, when it plots, uh, I find that they are around that they, they are around a hundred. 90 actual acquisitions are within this time series file. A lot of other useful information, uh, the data coverage in lat and long is, is here. The data size is here. And the result looks like this. You can see that from the earlier day, which is the reference date, uh, which is the first one by default. And you can see that slowly, we got the intersesmic deformation. 
are the Western US. So let's uh, get a question here. Why do we invert a network of small baseline filograms to estimate a single reference time series? Um, when, when I say single reference here, I mean the reference in time is a single referencing time series with relative to this first date. Why do we invert a small baseline network instead of forming a single reference network of inferiorance at the first place? Let's see your answer in, let's see your answer in chat. To minimize unwrapping and atmospheric errors. Is the other is the other answers? So the great, great to see many, great to see many answers. Um, so the answer to this is to minimizing the decorrelation. If you recall one slide from Harish on Wednesday, it shows us an, an example expand in the fieldgram in the Bay Area uh, with one is two years long, one is only a few days. And you can see that the temporal decorrelation affects the expand a lot. So by using the small baseline in the theorems, we get much less decorrelation noise, so that we can get a better result. Uh, we can we can keep the special we can keep the coherence of the data, because if you if we form a single in the theorem, single reference in the theorem, then you would then you would definitely have. Uh, to one inferogram of several many inferograms has a very long temporal baseline, which will decorrelate and uh, ruin the entire data sets. And uh, the atmosphere, actually, the atmosphere would be exactly the same, right? If there's no special decorrelation, if there's no decorrelation, then, uh, the, then the atmosphere will be the same, whatever approach that you're using. Great, I see many of you got it right. Okay, so now we have this time series. The next, uh, the next obvious step is usually to fit a line or get the secular velocity estimate from this time series. Let's just run this step. Because uh, people do the velocity or the linear slope uh, usually uh, at the first uh, on, on the first try because. Um, because a lot of physical, a lot of geophysical and human related processes are linear at the first order approximation. And we can get a grasp of the deformation of the ground deformation using the linear velocity. And of course, we can estimate a more fancy or complex time functions later words. And we will show that at the end of the session. Okay, it went pretty fast. And let's just see how it looks like. If we run the next step. So again, this is again using the view.py. And in this case, we used a more complex form. You can see here uh, to just uh, get a prettier plots. As you can see here, this is our first version of the ground deform of the ground deformation rate or the linear velocity at our study area. Let me just uh, trying to zoom in, come out a little bit so we can get the full size. Okay, I think we are good. So first with this, we can see that, um, we can see many of features, right? Um, this is the Bay Area and you can see San Francisco is right here. Every year AGU is around here. This is the Palo Alto, and here is the, um, what? Santa Clara. Thank Aquifer. you. Santa Clara. 
Yeah, and uh, we have uh, the black line here is the um, is the is the tectonic faults and the Sanders fault, the famous one, is right here. Here is another fault, the Hayward, which, uh, the Hayward fault, the Hayward fault. Thank you, Gareth. <laughs> um, I need to bring up my I need to bring up my notes here. <laughs> Um, so we can see. Let, let's let's first just let's first just uh, examine these results. First, we see that there's a special gradient here, right, from the orange to green to blue here, and uh, we have this is a uh, Sentinel One descending data. So the satellite, if you see my if you see my mouse, a satellite is flying around this direction. So the line of sight direction for this data set is around this direction. So what it means is that the positive value, which is the green, which is the orange and red here, the positive value is moving uh, towards this direction. Sorry, it's moving- um, Towards the satellite. It's towards the satellite direction. It's, to, it's from the ground towards satellite. So which is the around this direction. So which means that uh, the area on the right hand side of this is moving towards this direction and the, the area here in blue is moving towards this direction. This gives us a right lateral interseismic deformation, which is uh, consistent with the tectonic setting here, right? We have the North American plate here, we have the Pacific plate here, and they are moving uh, in a right lateral tectonic processes. Right, the Pacific plate is subducting under Alaska and being dragged to the northwest. Great. Thank you, Gareth. Let's see if everybody got their result here. What's the what's the black square? The oh, the black square is the reference point. All the by default, all the black square in MinPy represents the reference point by default. So everything is relative to this point. That's why we see that around here it's uh, green. Uh, it's a zero value. Great. I see people already got it right. Uh, did anyone see anything weird here? We see uh, many of them the boundaries of the special the boundaries of these uh, gradients. For example, right here, from green to blue, is actually aligned with the what's the fault name again? Which one? Right. This one. The Hayward. Hayward Fort. Thank you. Uh, it's aligned with the Hayward Fort uh, fault line very nicely. And you can see here, this one also aligned with a fault value, with a fault line. And Which this is the, one here also. The, the second fault was the Concord fault and the third one, the Calaveras. Thank you. For anyone who cares. I mean, I care. <laughs> I, I care. <laughs> it's, it's always interesting and useful. Um, so did anyone see anything weird here that you are not expecting? That you think is, that is unreasonable, or you can we uh, we cannot explain that uh, on the we cannot explain that based on based on our knowledge of the study area. What's going on on the upper left corner when we have? That, the, the line between light blue and dark blue. Uh, okay, what's go the up, 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 go up, no, uh, oh, there, there, there's the yeah, yeah. what's that line? Ah, great question, <laughs> yes, great question. What do you think is that? All right, many people say there are other people spot this too, great, yeah, and uh, Amrit think it's RP errors, Pablo thinks RP errors. Right, also it's actually very it's actually aligned with the with the frame boundaries, right? 
uh, we have the we have the satellite. This is actually exactly the the direction of the frame boundaries. So yeah, it's an unwrapping error. It's actually an unwrapping error uh, due to the imperfect phase stitching in our products. And we'll show later words how to correct that. So you can see that um, this RP errors is actually not uncommon. And uh, because phase stitching itself is actually not, so it is not, it's, it's a difficult job, is a difficult job than, than, than we think, much more difficult. Great, great job. Um, so after we have these velocities, we can also actually check the standard deviation of the velocities because we have once we got a, a inside time series, uh, we can see many dots similar to a GPS time series. If you see any, if you see that before, we just fit a line there, and then whenever we fit a line, we can also see the goodness of the fit of this line, right? And that is saved as a velocity standard deviation data set in the same file. And we can plot it right here. And it looks like this. So you can see the color limit is from zero to around uh, 0.8 millimeter per year. So it's actually a very, very small value. And we can see that the, again, the special reference point is right here. And the uncertainty is actually getting bigger once we're moving further away from the reference point, which makes sense, right? Because the because you can you can guess that the uncertainty here right now because we first because we first did a S pass inversion, so we minimized a lot of decorrelation impacts, and then the rest of the noise from this data set includes uh, atmosphere, includes the topographic residuals from DM errors, and includes other Geophysical process, geophysical effects, and the more specifically for the atmospheric propagation delay or troposphere, for example, troposphere is actually a specially correlated noise or or phase signals. So when 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 we mean specially correlated, we means when they are closer in space, they are similar. So that's why in here, ever since we are everything here is relative to this point, then your uncertainty of the pixels is big, is better or smaller once you are close to the reference point. So this is another reason we said in earlier, whenever we select a reference point, uh, we want this reference point is close to your area of interest. So that your, for example, if your area of interest is right here, then you are choosing a good reference point because the uncertainty here is much smaller than for example, the uncertainty is here or here. And the this one and the ones right here is actually uh, is actually big. It's actually uh, it's actually bigger uh, than its surroundings because uh, the deformation here, the displacement time series here is nonlinear, and uh, that's why a linear slope that we applied earlier does not capture the temporal behavior of the ground here very well. So that's why we also result in extra large uh, certainly right here. But this can be solved, and we will solve that. Later words. So, okay, I think I just answered this question. <laughs> um, let's see if there's any question on the chat. Right, this is a typical unwrapping error example. Right, similar like what um, similar like what the one showed on the chat also. That's unwrapping errors there too. Um, so I think so. Before we wrap up, uh, let's just basically uh, let's just basically wrap wrap up here. Uh, we can see that uh, the output of min pi in this case is a stack of interferograms, and we can invert this stack of interferograms into a time series. And then we can further estimate some temporal 
functions, in this case, a linear velocity to the time series, which uh, will highly summarize all the deformation behavior we have in this in our study area. So that's basically it. And everything can be controlled through the configuration file. And then we will show more examples in the next session. I think that's all for now. And then we are good. We're on good track in time, right? We are. Um, do you want to take a, a break until the hour? Yeah, let's do that. We'll be back at noon Pacific time. Please shift to your appropriate local time zone. About five minutes. Okay, it's noon. Let's let's fix some errors. Okay. So I see there's uh one more question from Amrit. Can we see turbulent delay in this map? How do we distinguish stratified delay and turbulence delay? Um a very good question. Um, is it easy to? I don't think it's so easy, right? Let me just share my screen first. I don't think we can see much uh, tropospheric delay right here because we have, as later as earlier we see, we have almost two hundred acquisitions in this um, in this time series, which is which is a very which is a pretty long one. And uh, once we do that, uh, once do once we do with once we estimate a, a linear velocity through the time series, we actually uh, mitigated a lot of tropospheric turbulences because tropospheric turbulences or the stratified delay of both of them are relatively random in time, especially the turbulence. The stratified delay may have some seasonal parameters, may, may have some seasonal behaviors. If you recall a slide, a figure from Herage's presentation, uh, but turbulent is pretty random in time. So once we estimate a linear slope through time, we get rid of a lot of them. And in this figure, I don't think we see a very strong, a very strong signal from tropospheric delay. Correct if, correct if, if I'm wrong, Gareth. I see a lot of um, surface subsidence and groundwater deformation that might you might think looks a bit like a troposphere signal, but a lot of those things you see are real. Like um, in the at the very top. And the kind of the orange area that that's that's a groundwater related deformation. That's a an aquifer which is uplifting. A lot of the dark blue around the edge of the bay is subsidence due to compaction of soil or settling of soils. That little kind of light blue streak that goes through San Francisco is an old basin that's filled in and is subsiding. Or I'm sorry, not subsiding. It's uplifting, but it's a. These are all. These are all. Um, related to the surface or the subsurface geology. Um, and uh, a lot of the things that people are interested in, especially engineers, are, are those features, not not the, the faults and things. Because um, a, a lot of these things can do damage to, to uh, infrastructure or they can be used to monitor groundwater levels. Great. The engineers better be paying attention to that Hayward fault, though. <laughs> Indeed. Um, you want to build some tolerance into any structures that cross that thing because it's moving. <laughs> and the the landslides I showed you yesterday are right next to that Hayward Fault. Um, there's a series of little dark blue splotches just below the unwrapping area. Oh, you mean right here? Yeah, that's, those are the landslides. Oh. So on the on the 
on the, on the counterpoint. So it's actually um, it's actually usually usually one of the big reasons I do time series analysis is try is to try to get rid of the tropospheric noise, and so instead of using a single pair of interferograms. If there's uh, if the troposphere is much bigger than your signal of interest. Okay, so let's resume. Um, let's see what, what where we are here. So in the previous session, we finished the blocks on the left, the the ones in blue, and then we got the raw phase time series. And from it, from there, we directly estimate a preliminary version of the average velocity. And now in this section, we will go through uh, most of the things in this green part, which often will be done in the time series domain. So let's go to a section here. Um, so when we talk about the interferometric the interfer metric phase, you will see a lot of uh, scenarios, this type of equations, which basically just tells us what contributions that we see in our interferometric phase. And uh, they are all usually almost the same with very slight differences. And in MinPy, we treat them in two categories, one of them in green, one of them in blue. And everything in green, including the deformation, which is usually sometimes uh, our signal of interest, uh, this part is atmosphere, including the atmosphere and troposphere. And this part is geometry, uh, everything related with geometry, such as the DM error and orbital errors. And for MSA data, there's another error called the timing error of the local oscillator. Basically, the clock of the radar on the satellite has some issue, which also give us some geometry issue. Uh, the Another one is the tidal effects, uh, including the solid earth tide, ocean tidal loading, whole tides, all kind of other things, all kind, all kind of tidal effects. And all of them, we can call them the systematic, the systematic component. And there's the second step in blue, which is uh, the steps uh, that we categorize as, as a different one because all the things in here, in green, in blue, that won't fulfill the zero phase closure criteria. What I mean is, I mean that if we have three acquisitions, A, B, and C, and we have this phase com com one, and we have this uh, data phi x, then the AB plus BC minus AC is not equal to zero, which it should, right? Uh, but there are occasions it doesn't. And the, the small baseline algorithm is actually relying on this assumption to um, to invert the network of interferograms into time series. And the, the, here are the processes that does not fulfill this assumption. Uh, the first one is the correlation noise. The second one is the, some potential phase RP errors. The third one is the processing inconsistency uh, in our processing due to the filtering and multi-looking. That will break the consistency a little bit also. And the last one is the what, what we call currently the non-closure phase from the short temporal baseline interferograms. Uh, you see a lot of that um, on you see a lot of that on the on the slides from Harash on Wednesday. Uh, this part was really new and was first found out by Homer Ansari from DRR at 2021. And we later we will show a work from Yu Jie Zheng, a postdoc used to be at Caltech now at UT Dallas. Um, uh, as a professor, uh, she wrote an algorithm to try to correct for this effect and is implemented in MinPy. So in this case, because we treated these two, because we treated the phase in two categories, uh, there are uncertainties from these two different categories also. So uh, that's why uh, in the first step, when we do the interferogram or the network inversion or the tensor estimation, the same words, uh, we are treating everything in green as one value. And then we are treating the blue one, the phi x as a noise. And then once we get rid of this in the time series part, then our deformation becomes a signal of interest. And we'll try to separate the contributions from atmosphere, geometry, and tidal processes from the estimated time series so that we can get a cleaned up a version of the displacement time series. 
So that is what we are doing in this section right now. So before we do that, we want to evaluate the quality of the inversion, basically how well, how well we got all the green estimates. And uh, we can very obviously think that um, one of the quality measure is the average spatial coherence, as you already, as some people, some people already asked. And uh, another, in, in addition to that, is the another term called temporal coherence. Temporal coherence is calculated at the, like this. Um, here, the phi hat is the estimated phase, is the estimated phase time series. Delta phi is the observed or the unwrapped in the filograms that we have as input. A is the design matrix between them. So the A times phi hat give us a constructed stack of interferograms from the estimated time series. And we can compare that and we can compare this reconstructed version with the observed version and then calculate a temporal average, which is what the other part is showing. So uh, the temporal coherence represents basically the consistency between our estimated time series and the observed unwrapped phase. And uh, this normalized from normalized into zero and one. So pixels with value close to zero are pixels that has are, are, are considered reliable and pixels with values close to zero are considered, are considered unreliable because those pixels, the reconstructed, uh, because, the, because for those pixels, the reconstructed in the fairgrounds, the reconstructed unwrapped phase is very different from the observed phase. So it's unreliable. And uh, this is the part where we actually using a threshold. And by default, we usually use a 0.7 as a threshold to mask out those pixels with unreliable low temporal coherence value. And we can see that, see how it looks like. The temporal coherence will be generated uh, during our network inversion step, this file. And this uh, average spatial co coherence, we already see that earlier. And this is the temporal coherence and how it looks like. And we can see the two of them, they are actually very similar with high coherence on the urban area and a low coherence and low values in the, uh, in the vegetated areas in the mountains, et cetera. But we also see a clear line here, right? This right line, this line between around the 80, around the 38 latitude on the north. And uh, this is actually uh, overlap or aligned with uh, aligned with the feature that we suspect as unwrapping errors earlier. Which is a great thing because we don't see that from the average spatial coherence. So uh, let's since we are here at the temporal coherence, let's ask one question. First is for a network of interferograms with only one interferogram between each acquisition and the subsequent acquisition, basically a sequential network of interferograms, how would the temporal coherence looks like? Can we see your, let's see your answer in the chat. Remember the, remember this is how we calculate. And we calculate that we use the, we run the small baseline approach so that we can explore the redundancy between different, uh, between different inferograms covering the same time period. And uh, if we only have a sequential inferior network, which means we don't really have any redundancy, then our inversion will be exact. The solution will be exact with no redundancy. And what will happen in that case between the observed phase and the reconstructed phase? Basically the temporal coherence value here. Let's see your answers in the chat. Uh, 
Okay, so many people says my either it could be very low, close to zero or zero or one. And uh, if you think about it, the, okay, more one and there will be high. So yeah, so the answer is it will be one, right? Uh, assuming that we have, again, we have AB3 AB uh, three acquisition, we can form, if we only form AB, and BC two inferior grams, then we will get an estimate, and uh, then there's no redundancy check. Then this, then then the difference between the rec reconstruction and the observation will be exactly the same because the solution is exact. The whole system is exact. It's not under or over determined. It's exactly determined. So in this, so in that case, the temporal coherence will be a perfect one, and the temporal coherence value then at that time will be useless. So that's why for small baseline approach, the temporal baseline, uh, the temporal coherence is actually uh, is actually only useful once we have enough redundancy. Okay, so now uh, another question is, we now see these two quality metrics. So one is the average spatial coherence, another is the temporal coherence. And we can see that the generally they are almost the same, but it is different among these regions. And uh, let's see, the question is, under what conditions an area with high average spatial coherence will show an abnormally, abnormally low temporal coherence? Basically, the two patterns between temporal coherence and average spatial coherence will be different under what conditions that will happen. Uh, A, when we have strong tropospheric delay. B, when we have strong decorrelation. C, when we have phase therapy errors. And D, when we have a very fast deformation. Okay, we have all we have all the four answers. So first, let's just check the answer one by one. When we have strong tropospheric delay, uh, when we first is that we know that the tropospheric delay won't affect the coherence value, right? And uh, so when we have strong tropospheric delay, we, we could still maintain a high, coherence value. So A is not right. B, uh, strong decorrelation. The decorrelation will give us a low spatial coherence, but you can see it from here. Also in this case, uh, in the vegetated mountains, we have low temporal coherence also. So it's not B. And D, when we have fast deformation, which is similar, if you think about it, is similar to B. Uh, think about the Examples earlier in the beginning of the in the beginning of the day, one person showed an earth cold seismic earthquake. Um, cold seismic deformation map of the Turkish earthquake, and in that case, the deformation along the fault or in the near field of the of the surface rupture is actually very fast and very dense. You can see we will see very high spatial gradient of the deformation. That is the fast deformation example, and in that case, we will have strong decorrelation or or low spatial coherence also. And in that case, we will also have a special, a low temporal coherence. So the answer is C. Does that make sense, everyone? Great. So Leon Tsai ask, uh, what I want to ask is, Will the timing result be better if there are more baselines? Uh, I don't get your question. Maybe if you could clarify more. I don't. I don't get you. What do you mean? Uh, there's a long temporal baseline. Adding a long temporal baseline. Long temporal or long spatial, right? Oh, okay. 
Yeah. Because I think if you add more space, if you relax the re assumption on spatial baseline, then you could get more interferograms. But yeah. they might, depending what your target was, it might not help. If it was on a slope, say, having longer baselines might just mean those big, you let more decorrelated data into your inversion. Right. And especially, for example, in the, in the areas with very steep topography, like uh, Himalaya, then the large, then the pairs with large perpendicular baseline may not be a good idea. And uh, in the normal, in the, in the other normal cases, uh, I recall the perpendicular baseline or the spatial baseline for Sentinel-1 is actually very small. So actually nowadays, when we're talking about a small baseline, what it really means is for Sentinel-1 means the small temporal baseline because the, uh, the decorrelation from the large spatial baseline is actually uh, pretty negligible because the orbit control of Sentinel-1 is, is so good. So is, uh, Amrit asks, is there any rule of thumb for selecting a number of redundant interferograms? Um, I usually use three or five. Uh, and this nowadays with the Sentinel-1 is getting one is getting bigger and bigger. So we so recently I processed that I get, get over, in this case also we get over 200 acquisitions. So if we select a number of five connections or redundancy, then will give us around a thousand inferograms, uh, which is already a lot. Um, but uh, I actually usually still trying to get five if my computers allows, so that um, so that the so that the good thing is later we will show that um, uh, sometimes we have low spatial coherence inferograms uh, because of whatever reasons, um, and we don't know that in advance. So in practice, it's just much easier. We get we generate as much interferograms as possible, and later words we can choose to not use them instead of generating not enough interferograms, and then we have to rerun the whole stack processing, which takes a, a long time. Okay, so we have um, so okay so from so from the temporal coherence, we see uh, the phase unwrapping errors. And now let's see, let's confirm that. And again, what we mean by phase unwrapping errors, we just literally means the errors happen during the phase unwrapping. So the unwrapping error will always be, has a magnitude of an integer number of two pi. And these unwrapping errors uh, will affect our time series estimation. Let's look at one example by running this cell. In this case, uh, we're calling the view the py again, and you can see the command line usage here, and we're plotting a few interferograms. And uh, now you can clearly see that these few are the examples of RMP errors, and it's super clear, right? So actually, usually, usually a lot of times, that's why I plot all the data set uh, in minpy to check, uh, to check at, at least a quick view to check all the unwrapped phase because a lot of problems is actually very easy to spot in the interference the level, for example, like here. But in practice, uh, we cannot check, uh, we don't, but in practice, there's an easier way. Uh, there's a lot of interference in practice, so we cannot, uh, so an easier way to check everything here, or at least remind us to check every single interference is, um, is to find, is to calculate this number. This number is called the non-zero, uh, it's called what? Let me just find the number. Uh, yeah, it's called the number of interferogram triplets with non-zero energy ambiguity, T int. How you calculate? Again, we have uh, acquisition IJK. We can calculate a closure phase called C IJK. And then we can remove the wrapped component from the closure phase to get the integer component, which is here. And then we can find, and then we can count these C integer component among all the potential triplets. 
in our stack of interferogram, which will give us a t int value. And this is what the this is covered in the quick overview step in MinPy. Let's just run this. So what we mean is that the unwrapping error, again, is one of the errors that will break the phase closure. Uh, and that means the integer component of the closure phase will be non-zero. And we can and we can count the non-zero integer component among all the potential triplets in our data set. Okay, so the question is answered. Great. Okay, it's done. Let's see how it looks like. So it looks like this. Um, this is the map view, and on the right is the histogram of the map view on the left. And uh, the for each pixel again, the color here represents the number of individual triplets has non-zero, that has non-zero niche ambiguity. So we can see that again, this uh, uh, square is uh, the reference point and everything that is close to the reference point, you can see this dot blue, which is zero value. And uh, here is a light, actually the light blue value. So basically we can see that uh, among this region where there's RP errors, we can see a very sharp uh, boundary in the T in the value also. And we can see that, um, in the histogram here also, which is basically this peak. Note that the y-axis here is in log scale. So this value is actually much, much higher than everything below here. So basically um, t int uh, this file or this figure is actually a great way to check our stack of inferograms is they are potential, is they are face RP errors. If they are, we will usually see a non-zero, we will usually see a peak at the non-zero value. A peak at a zero value is fine, as you understand here, but a peak at the non-zero value, or you can see around here, then it's not fine. Then that's a sign to tell to tell you to check to, to, to remind you that there are RMP errors in your time series. And, uh, and one more thing is that um, even though this ARP error, ha we have it here, but it is actually, but it's actually kind of coherent, right? What I mean coherent, I mean the T int value among these regions is the same. Not, not, but not like these regions. Like these regions, the T int value is random. It's relatively random. So this kind of a coherent ARP errors, we can correct them and we will correct them right away. So here the question is, after time series inversion, which metric better represents the quality of the inversion? A, the average spatial coherence, B, the temporal coherence, C, the common mask from the kinetic component, which we showed at the very beginning in the last session, in, in the previous session, D, the water mask, which, which indicates which pixel is water and which pixel is land. Let's see your answer in the chat. Great, I'm so happy to see everybody is on board with this. So temporal coherence, uh, to me, is always one of the best friends uh, in the inside tensors analysis. We always want to rely on that to check the quality and especially the inversion quality or the estimation quality of our time series. Great. Yeah, there's a question. Uh, that's a good question. What's a triplets? Let me uh, show you here. When we mean triplets, we mean a triplet, we mean three interferograms forms, uh, forms, forms a closed loop. We have A, we have I, J, K. So we have I, J, J, K, and I, K. That forms a closed loop. So we can uh, do a quick checking because here, uh, if the this is the interferogram triplet, this is the interferogram triplet, which will give us a phase, we call that the closure phase, 
and this closure phase ideally should be closed, should be equals to zero, but occasionally it's not. And one of the case, one of the cause is because of the unwrapping errors. Okay, so we have the, so we now know for sure that we have unwrapping errors in our, in our data set, how can we correct them? MinPy provides uh, three ways to correct these unwrapping errors. The first one is bridging, is uh, actually a very uh, old algorithm existing for a long time uh, in the inside community. Basically that we have two areas, uh, if you look, if you see my hands, if we have two areas uh, with RMP errors, uh, and we know of, and we know based on based on prior knowledge of study area that there's no phase jump between the two areas, but they are but it's still unwrapped uh, incorrectly because maybe there's a river or there's a mountain there, and we can just force the two of them to connect by assuming a, a smooth constraint in the phase in space, uh, basically just by, look like adding a bridge between the two land. Uh, so it's called bridging, and uh, MinPy implemented an uh, automatic procedure to these Asian algorithms so that we can do that automatically to a lot of interferograms. And uh, it's based, it's, it's heavily rely on the connect, connected component from Snafu uh, or other algorithms or other RNP algorithms. Uh, and when we connect the bridges, we are actually connecting different groups of kinetic component by bridging them together. The second one is called the phase closure uh, proposed by Harish in the first place. And then the phase closure again is because in the earlier we see that the RMP error will break the phase closure because we whenever it get us the unzero energy ambiguity of the phase closure. So the phase closure approach is basically enforcing a closure on this equation by solving an unknown parameters in time so that and adding the and and adding an uh, integer number of two pi to each pixel so that the integer component of the closure phase will close you can find more details in the equations in the uh, in our paper here if you if you want to know the details uh, the third is basically just combining the two method by first applying the bridging, then apply the phase closure on top of that. And uh, usually, uh, okay, and, uh, not usually, occasionally, the third one will give us the best result. And we can turn this option, turn this correction on by assigning this template option in MinPy. For example, in here, we try to use bridging. Let's just uh, update our configuration file like this, and then run the correction step. So you can see that from the output, um, so in this case, we updated the, the we updated the customized configuration file here, and then this, and then the code will read this customized template, and then update the default template based on it. In this case, it update this option from auto value, which is no, to bridging. So you can always make sure uh, reading this part in your, in your output to make sure the code is doing what, what you expect it to do. And uh, again, here what it does is literally, uh, since we have one, since we have the kinetic component for each in few grams, so the, the so this algorithm is doing this bridging for every single interferogram based on the kinetic component. The one asked question: uh, Can we solve the recent Turkish events army error problem using the hybrid approach? I don't think so. Um, uh, I was going to say no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> uh, uh, the problem there is that the gradient in phase is more than one fringe per pixel in some places, and you could never unwrap that. 
Right. So that it's not that they were using a different pair would get you an independent estimate that you could use to compare to the the other one. They're all, they're all going to have that problem. So it's more to the scenario like this region. The RP error uh, there is actually pretty um, random and complex, not like this simple coherent RP error we showed here. Even in our case here, we're not correcting the RP errors, for example, in this region. If you follow my mouse uh, cursor, these regions RP errors, we're not correcting them. We're only correcting this uh, consistent light blue part. Is there any precondition to apply bridging? Um, yeah, yes. Uh, so usually when I apply bridging, I will look at this figure first, which is routinely generated uh, in when whenever you run the small baseline app. Um, and I usually look at this. Um, again, what we want is really the second take home point, take home message. Um, the current algorithm actually only could only usually successfully correct for RP errors if a lot of pixels they're sharing the same RP errors, which is relatively easy to correct, but uh, which is basically the light blue here. So whenever in our in this figure I see the picture like this, or there might be not a sharp boundary like this if there are two just two islands and we know there's no deformation between the two islands, uh, then I will apply bridging also, but it's usually important to check the to check the correction um, results uh, in after the correction because this um, algorithm is not a hundred percent robust, and we can do that. Uh, we'll show we'll show how to check that right away after. After we finish the running, and we can check, we can check that here, because uh, eventually, uh, because the small baseline app will plot all the all the all the files, including the unwrapped phase before and after the corrections. So I usually just to compare the to compare those two to make sure you can, you can see that I actually usually very uh, you visually very easily. There's a question in the Q and A about um, incorporating one, you know, one year interferograms in your time series analysis, and then what if that is beneficial if you're looking for small signals? Yes, yes, uh, we have that right here actually. If you recall the, if you recall our our network, this is actually the one year pair, one year temporal baseline in the fieldgrams from area. Uh, and it specifically is, and it was specifically generated to to mitigate the closure phase bias, a topic which we will touch soon in this section also, uh, because of the closure phase. And we want to we want to mitigate that and add in some and uh, the work uh, that UJ conducted and, and tested shows that adding some of this year long or six months long or two years long, if you can, um, in the program pairs will, since will significantly uh, mitigate the impact from the closure phase bias. But usually, uh, but, you need, but you want to check that if this year long in the fieldgrams are highly decorrelated, uh, then, then it becomes useless because we want everything in mean, everything in inside coherent, right? But just to be clear, the uh, this does not correct for the uh, for the closure phase. It just mitigates the impact. If you want to correct for it, you would have to do a full network solution, a full covariance matrix solution. Right. Thank you, friends.
Okay, uh, the result is, the running is done. Let's plot the result. I'll just compare that. So this is um, showing for one pair, for one infogram that we previously has RP errors, as you can see here. And after correction, you can see from the label, after correction, it becomes smooth. And uh, is doing that using the connect component shown on the right by basically adding a bridge between the red and the blue patches. So simply as that. And uh, the another way, another important part in practice actually to improve your quality of in the, of your time series is actually the network modification because uh, we usually want to modify the network to drop the low coherent interferograms to mitigate the impact of the correlation. And we also occasionally, if the interferogram has RMP errors and we cannot correct them using the early approaches, then we will also want to drop them to, to reduce or remove the impact from the phase RMP errors. So there are many options to modify a network uh, usually for me, I like the most is the coherence based network modification. What we mean by that is this figure. Uh, we have for each interferogram, a uh, special coherence already. So we know exactly how the coherence looks like for each interferogram. And simply because of that, we just apply a threshold to the interferogram and the drop all the low coherent pairs, which is shown on the left. Each again, each line here shows why it shows one one interferogram, and the color of the line represents the coherence of the interferogram. So we basically just drop all the low coherent red, low coherent interferograms, the lines in red. And we can see the impact of this is actually very visual. Uh, if we include them, for example, including the, all this one, which has a huge, this is the ALOS1 data set, which we have, we have a big perpendicular baseline of over a thousand meters and a temporal baseline in this case of over three years. And in this case, because of this low coherence, we have, we lost uh, the temporal coherence value around this region, which is the, this is in Galapagos. And this region is the crater or the, the caldera of Sierra Negra volcano, and which is actually our signal of interest because there's a lot of crazy, crazy inflations there, and eruptions also. So, in so, so basically, you see that, and because of that, once we choose, uh, once we apply a threshold and choose the reliable pixels, a lot of pixels within the caldera got maxed out, and if we drop those red lines and redo the inversion, we can see our temporal coherence got significantly better within the caldera and then more, almost all the pixels there got kept and identified as reliable. So it's basically, so it's nothing special here. It's just a practical tip, which is actually turns out to be super useful whenever uh, you do your tensor analysis. And of course, because uh, in addition to a thresholding based on the special coherence, uh, we can of course just apply a single criteria, for example, the maximum temporal baseline the maximum spatial baseline, or you just want to manually uh, pick and, and exclude some dates or sign the uh, Those options are all available in MinPy, and you can find that through the link here. If you click this one, it will take you to the, um, to the GitHub. These are all the template options that is available to modify the network. And then you can take a detailed look later words on this.
And the note that is uh, by modifying the network, the interferons are not actually physically removed. I mean, by they just uh, we just add another extra uh, 1D matrix, which will just uh, put a flag to each interferon, uh, so that you can always rerun and remodify the choices. All the all the data of the, all the interferons will still be there, so you can always adjust the criteria and rerun your network modification. And uh, whenever we modify the network, we want to rerun the network inversion. And uh, previously, we run the network inversion using no weight at all to for the speed up for the fattest approach, which is the classic approach used in the first uh, small baseline paper also. And nowadays, we can do a, a liberal modern version by adding weight. And MinPy has many options to apply different weight. And uh, the and including the including using the phase covariance of the interferogram calculated based on the spatial coherence, or using the feature information matrix, uh, there are some equations from this paper also, or directly just use spatial coherence as weight. And uh, besides that, you can also apply a pixel-wise masking. What I mean that is we have um, we have we have a three D matrix of the armed face, right? So we can also apply a slightly different masking to each pic to each pixel at each in the filograms, and we can do that using a special coherence thresholding or using kinetic component. And in this case, we are not doing anything because uh, when we applied weighting. Uh, weighting is similar to stress holding using special coherence. So for those pixels with low coherence value, they will have a lower weight in the inversion also. So that's why usually uh, I usually just apply a weight inversion, but without special masking during the inversion. And uh, after the inversion, uh, we calculate the temporal coherence. And temporal coherence, uh, based on that, we generate a mask of the reliable pixels using the thresholding. So you can adjust your threshold here. For example, by default is uh, 0.7. Another small thing is the optim optimization criteria or the objective function. Uh, when we apply, when we invert for the small baseline network, we are solving for a least square equation. Um, uh, ca from the original Bradino, Bradino paper. And uh, we are minimizing, basically we're minimizing the non-closure phase of the interferon triplets when we're doing the S-pass inversion. But instead of minimizing the phase, we could also minimizing the phase velocity, basically the temporal derivative of that. And that is actually turns out to be a physically a better solution. So that is actually turned on and used always used by default in MinPy. So, okay, so now let's uh, just redo the inversion. Since we apply, since we um, correct for the RP error earlier, let's see how it affects the estimation of the time series. May take a few minutes. Let's see if there's some, let's see if, let's see if there's some questions. There was a question about um, closure errors and fading bias. I said that we might get to that uh, in a little bit. Am I right? right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll get to that a little bit. It's a, it's a, it's a new topic. It's still very hot, and uh, and uh, we will get to that, and uh, we'll provide a solution to that in MinPy. Um, but we will show a very briefly of that today. We will not go through the entire procedure because the entire procedure was would take a while to run. And I think Rowena might mention something about it too.
I think there's a question on, right, uh, question on ARM error correction for gamma products. Um, theoretically, uh, we can apply the phase closure ARM error correction for gamma products without the kinetic component, but implementation details was that we cannot in practice because uh, because the phase closure is uh, the the calculation is big, is very big. Um, think about this: we have nowadays we in this case we have two hundred acquisitions, so we have generated over around a thousand infograms, and from this a thousand infograms we can actually form potentially around 4,000 in if you triplets. So the phase closure uh, estimation is actually a calculation of 4,000 by 4,000 matrix, which is huge. And uh, so I choose to uh, leveraging or using the common connected component in MinPy to reduce the to reduce this big matrix operation by for each group of kinetic of kinetic component randomly select a hundred pixels only instead of so that uh, for our entire stack if we have just four kinetic components then we are only doing that big matrix operation 400 times instead of in this case we have actually a million pixels and if we do that a million times, uh, I tried that many years ago, run on a supercomputer uh, or local cluster of computer and run a week and still didn't finish. So, uh, so in practice, so in practice, uh, we cannot run. So that's why I choose that approach. And then in practice, we cannot run face closure correction uh, to gamma products also. Okay, let's see the result of the new temporal coherence. Voila. And you can see that the jump or the sharp boundaries between the previous RP errors is gone. Okay, so, and you will notice that also, even though these RP errors are gone, we can see that among these islands, this is San Francisco. So the um, the Golden Bridge bridge, the Golden Bridge is around here, and uh, we see many islands around here, and they are still has low temporal coherence. What does that mean? Does that means uh, so? What does that mean? Let's see your chat. Let's see your answer in the chat. For example, can we trust the time series results for pixels on this island. I think that's Angel Island. <laughs> Thank you, that's this one, huh? Yeah. And the other two might actually be part of the, the Marin headlands. There's a little, they could actually be connected to the land. It's just the frame cuts them off. <laughs> So yeah, so first uh, the bridging is not good enough for this region uh, because of another practical reason in bridging, I uh, applied actually a threshold to not correct for um, to not correct for any regions that are smaller than a certain amount of pixels. You can adjust that also, of course. Uh, there's a template option for that. But in this case, by default, uh, since this is so small, uh, the algorithm just skipped the correction for this island, and uh, there are still Arab errors around this island. I mean, there are tropospheric effect in this island as well, but the low temporal coherence value in this island is still because of the Arab errors. And the and another question related with this is, for example, if uh, we're interested in a time series on this island, where should we put the reference point to? Because currently we're putting the reference point here, right? Let's see your answer in the chat.
Great. Uh, I see two or three answers, two, two answers already. So, so yeah, so if so, so if it's me, I would put uh, as the first two answer, put the reference point right in on the bridge. For example, if you if there's some building on the bridge that is your signal of interest and the rest of the island is not, uh, I would put a reference point on the island because everything in INSAR is relative, including RP errors. So even if there's RP errors, uh, as long as you are the same as the reference point, you're fine. So that's why, uh, so that's why in this case, in the earlier case, we don't have RP errors around the lower patch whenever it's the same, whenever they're in the same patch as the reference point. If you like going and fixing unwrapping errors manually, then you could manually set the uh, manually bridge the interferograms, perhaps, and then you could unwrap. Then it would be unwrapped properly. We used to do stuff like that before we had hundreds or thousands of interferograms. These days, right. you just throw it out. <laughs> right. That's that. That's actually where I learned where where I learned the bridge in the first place. Actually, from from the S forum. Yeah, uh, no. there was a Perl script in Roypack, right? You could run to manually bridge into between um between areas mm -hmm. on an interferogram. Those were the days. Okay, so we now are fine with the temporal coherence. That means we are fine with the inversion of these of the of the network. And so the next step, oh we almost topped the tower. Let's just let's speed out this a little bit faster. So then the next is to do the uh, noise reduction or the phase correction of the tan series, basically separating the troposphere, the uh, the DM error, etc. And uh, in this step for the troposphere correction, uh, there are many options uh, in MinPy. Also, first one is the using the global atmospheric models such as ERA five uh, using Pi APS a code wrote by Roman Juliet. Uh, another is to use the GECOS services uh, developed uh, university, uh, at the University of Newcastle in UK uh, by Zheng Hong, by Zheng Hong Li's group. The third one is the empirical relationship between the tropospheric delay and topography, basically assuming that, uh, which is usually the case also, assuming that the the tropospheric delay is having a linear relationship with the height of the pixels, and you can fit a line to this to this uh to in the scatter, and then and then treat that estimated slope as the contribution from troposphere. But you can imagine that this is a, a data dependent, insert phase dependent uh phase correction. So it has strong assumptions, and uh, that means um that means we really need to check those assumptions and uh, should not apply them if that's if your signal of interest is also linearly correlated with your topography. For example, in many cases, volcanoes, um, that. And after the correction, uh, and after, after all the other correction, for example, MinPy, in the beginning, we have a time series H5 file. For example, after the correction using PyAPS, and selecting ERA5, it will generate a new file uh, with a suffix of ERA5. So the another one is the solid earth tide. Uh, it's basically the deformation of the solid earth uh, due to the gravity pool between the from the sun and the moon, and which will, which will implement, which will introduce a very long special wavelength uh, deformation gradient in our inside phase. And uh, this is slowly deforming in space, but actually fast deforming in time. But this effect is actually already well studied uh, many tens of years ago. And there's very good models and physical models for that uh, called the IERS conventions. And, uh, and I wrote a code a couple of years back to implement, uh, to wrap around the code they, they, they distributed and they incorporate that into, into MinPy. So you can turn it on and then correct for that using this option. The another one is another long special wavelength deformation uh, called the plate motion because uh, because for example, Sentinel-1 is actually 
because our INSAR phase reference frame is actually the same as the satellite that we're using. Uh, more specifically, the, the satellite orbit data we're using. And for Sentinel-1, the orbit data is with respect to the ITRF 2014 reference frame. And in that reference frame, the satellite is, and in that reference frame, the ground tectonic plate is moving as shown, for example, here in the Eurasia plate, Arabia plate and Australia plate. And for example, in here, the Australia, uh, let's say here in, uh, in Arabia plate is moving uh, as shown in the orange arrows here. And if we have a uh, ascending track moving towards this direction, then our line of sight direction is almost parallel to the plate motion of the Arabia plate in the ITIF reference frame. Then this uh, relative motion will introduce because of the variation of the line of sight instance angle within the scene, then this uniform plate motion will actually uh, project it into a special variable plate motion phase in our INSAR. And that as shown here in the bottom. So we can see basically that the plate motion will introduce a uh, a long special wavelength gradient also. And this was found out a long time ago and then reconfirmed by Oli Stephenson and uh, Yuan Kai Liu, uh, two students from Caltech. And then they also write a code uh, which implements, uh, which wrap around the plate motion model of this reference frame and then implement it into MintPy as well. And there's a script called plate motion. And you can just run the plate motion minus minus help to check the usage of that. Okay, so, so the last one is the, uh, the second last one is the closure phase bias. Uh, recent studies shows that once we do an SBAS, and especially we're using, if we're using only small temporal baseline interferograms, we will result in a biased displacement time series and velocities. It was first found out by Homer Ansari back at 2020 and published at 2021. And this um, bias, bias is confirmed in many studies and they eventually linked that to the non-closure of the inferior triplets or the non-zero closure phase. Uh, what it means literally is again, we have the closure phase defined here and this closure phase, even though it might be co it might be still coherent and it's not equal to zero. So Yu Jie Zheng, uh, a currently a professor at UT Dallas, he developed, she developed a simple model that explain both the non-zero closure phase and the observed systematic bias. And it shows that the, this non-closure phase actually is, can be an indicator of some temporally inconsistent physical processes. Uh, that's the best uh, descriptions I learned from her. And uh, more straightforward physical words, uh, we don't know yet. Uh, some of them, attribute that to the soil moisture and there could be other process, processes also. This is still relatively early and a very active area of research. But even though we don't know the physical processes of this bias very well right now, uh, it can, if you don't think, if you think of that as a noise, it can be corrected. UGA provided a, an algorithm to correct for this bias, and it has been implemented in MinPy as well, called the closure phase, the P bias, the PY. Uh, and then you can run that to correct for it. And here is one example uh, we just did in Southern California, where the first, the top row are the regular S bus, just with a different level of redundancy. BW means bandwidth. Uh, it's basically the number of sequential connections we have one sequential connection network or five or 10. And we can see that uh, that they have slightly different values. Note that here, the color bar is very small from minus one to one centimeters. So, so we can see that once we have a, a longer temporal baseline or bandwidth of 10, we actually got less affected by this closure phase bias. But anyway, no matter the number of connections we have, uh, we can actually estimate it, this closure phase bias as shown in the middle, and then remove that from the estimation. And then after corrections, we can get the consistent uh, linear velocities in this region 
no matter regardless of the number of redundancies that, that we're using, uh, basically confirming that the, effect, the effectiveness of this uh, algorithm. And how it corrects, uh, I just here I will introduce uh, this long, uh, it's a long, it's, 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 a comp it's complicated in terms of math. Uh, we will here today just show you one core concept of this algorithm, which is called the sequential closure phase. Previously, when we have said, when we have closure phase, we mean uh, in different triplets. We have A, B, three, and we form a closed loop among these three interferons. Uh, UG introduced a sequential closure phase, which means that, for example, if we have five acquisitions, we can actually form interferon pairs, interferon triplets. Interferon, we can form a closure phase using one, two pair, two, three pair, three, four pair, four, five pair, and then one, five pair. So it's a much longer or bigger uh, loop of the closure phase. And it turns out when the closure phase loop or the sequential closure phase is long, uh, it's much, much less affected by the closure phase bias. And then she used that as a reference to correct for the bias uh, in a much smaller, uh, in a short temporal baseline diagrams. So uh, again, running that correction will take a while. So we're not running that today, but we are generating a quality mask, a quality uh, parameter from this algorithm, uh, which is called the average sequential closure phase. It's basically just one 2D matrix showing how big of the impact of the closure phase to our data set. And in this case, uh, one key part is to choose the connection level. Because again, this closure phase is found out to affect the short temporal baseline interference the most. So if we have a long temporal baseline interference, uh, from our current understanding, it's much less affected by that. And we're choosing that in this case, because of the data set, I know that we have the maximum connection level of 28 because of the annual pairs. And, and I'm choosing that and uh, generating uh, impact parameter, which we can show plotted right here. It will generate a, it will generate, it will generate a file called this, and then it's a complex value. So we can plot the amplitude and the phase of it. And we can see this then again, this amplitude, this closure phase, uh, again, this average closure phase uh, is normalized. Uh, so we have the amplitude uh, varying from zero to one, uh, when it's close to one, which means the it's very closed. So we are much so it's much less affected by that. And uh, you can choose the and then the, and then we can identify the pixels that are affected by the closure phase bias by combining the two. Well, the closure phase when it has a low amplitude and a high phase then we know it's much more affected by the closure phase bias. So in this, so in this case, uh, the, the threshold we're choosing is what? The threshold we're choosing is the amplitude is, if, it, if the amplitude is less than 0.4, and if the phase is more than three sigma of the phase variance, and the detection result is on the far right. So we can see basically that um, the pixels around here, which is uh, which is the San Bruno Mountain State Park on the southern part of on the southern side of San Francisco, there's a lot of pixel here, which is shown on the face around here. They are potentially affected by the closure phase bias, and we want to be careful on the interpretation of that if we did not correct for it. And actually, on average, I count that uh, around twenty around twelve pixels around twelve percent of pixels on land in this data set are actually, are actually potentially can be affected by the non-closure phase bias. So which is actually not so small. Again, if you want to correct for that, uh, please follow the UGA wrote a Jupyter notebook, a separate Jupyter notebook on how to run this script. You can click the link here, which will bring you to GitHub. And then she shows the exact example that she used in the um, in her paper. 
which will show you how to go through what we go through today is the mask. And, they will have, and this notebook will show you how to go through the entire procedure for estimating uh, the closure phase bias and remove that from your infograph, from your time series. Okay, so the last few is um, the deramping. Uh, traditionally, or, or um, if your deformation signal of interest is short, uh, is is small or small in space or short temporal or short spatial wavelengths such as line substance, volcanoes, etc., then you don't care about the long spatial wavelength deformation such as the tectonic ones or the ramps due to strong ionosphere, for example, then a, a very simple and easy way is to just uh, uh, estimate a plane or linear surface ramp uh, from your data and remove it. And of course, if your signal of interest is the long spatial wavelength deformation, then you don't want to do that. And uh, that can be turned on and off using this option. Another one is again, is uh, the DEM error. Uh, DM error is because of the inaccuracy of the DM. Basically, if you since uh, basically if the DM, if the height of the DM does not reflect the real height of the target on the ground, then it will cause a DM error and introduce a phase component, you know, in a few grams. And in the time series, the con the contribution of this component is actually correlated with the perpendicular baseline time series. So because of this relationship, we can estimate the DM error and then remove them. And then you can find details in Harash uh, Harash and uh, Falk Amlong's paper at 2013, which is what is implemented in MinPy. And we can do that very quickly here. First, we updated the template and then we run it. I think uh, the answer was the question was answered. Let's first finish this part. Um, so the DM error estimation is done, and let's see how it looks like. You can see it looks like this. Um, this was applied to all to all pixels. So for example, we can see here again, uh, the even everything is relatively in INSAR, including this estimate DM error. So we have a refer reference point, and then everything around the reference point has a uh, estimated DM error of zero. In practice, could not be zero. It may not be zero, but because, but we cannot uh, get that absolute value. And now let's see, so now let's uh, see the question. Okay, I think it's got answered. Yeah, great. Um, I think it will be a little bit run over time. So let's continue this. So we have done, you can see where there's, there are many uh, approaches to remove uh, different phase contributions from all kinds of physical processes that we think might be not be displacement and we want to remove them. And there's still a limit. So we cannot uh, do a perfect removal or correction for all those processes. And then we still want to somehow have a grasp or an idea of how well the noise level is in the remaining time series after all these corrections. And uh, MintPi provide a very simple way of, of, of kind of a rule of thumb or first order way to estimate that on the acquisition level, basically by um, basically by calculating the root mean square value of the residual of the residual phase for each acquisition. So we get uh, and we treat that as the phase that we cannot correct it for using previous approaches or we cannot model for using uh, temporal functions. Then those, are the phase or the residual phase that we just don't know with the current approach. We don't know how to better remove them yet. And we treat that as the noise and calculate an RMS value from that for each 2D metric or for each acquisition. 
then we can get a 1D RMS value for that, right? And that is what this step is doing. And uh, it will write, uh, write that into a TXT file. And uh, we can use that uh, to identify basically the noisy acquisitions. For example, maybe there's a strong ionosphere and some acquisition, and we have if we have not correct for that earlier, then that will result uh, optimally high RMS value, and we want to remove that from our analysis afterwards. So there's a question: Why the default RMS cutoff value is three? So the three is actually the cutoff is three actually means three sigma. So we have that one D RMS time series. We think that as a as a distribution of population, then we calculate uh then we calculate the STD or or more specifically actually is the median absolute deviation, uh, another statistical term which is more robust against the outliers. We use that and then they treat everything with RMS value larger than the three median absolute deviation of that. Let's show how it looks like. This is just plotted. So it looks like this. And we got one value for each for every single acquisition. And the R and the dashed line here are the three kind of a three sigma or the three median absolute deviation value. And then we can see that for this data set, almost every single one of them is uh, below that, which is a good, good news. That means we don't have an abnormally strong residual phase or noises in our data set. And of course, if you want to, of course you can remove, you, you can adjust the cutoff value. Sometimes uh, I use two instead to get rid of those uh, high values to, and which can occasionally also give us a, a cleaner time series, a cleaner velocity if we want to feed on it. Another useful thing for this is that um, we can find actually the noisy acquisitions and also the clean acquisitions, right? And we can use those clean acquisitions as the reference in time instead of the by default the first one. Because uh, when we do the 2D plot, everything is still relative to the reference date. So if the reference date is noisy, everything else will look noisy. So uh, so we can do that. And uh, for example, in this time, uh, in this data set, it's find that this date has the minimum noise, minimum RMS value. And we can choose that as the reference date, which is this step. But note that uh, changing the reference date does not really, does not really change in the, changing the time series. It's basically just shifting, or you can, you can think of that as for one pixel. Is literally just shifting this entire time series up and down along the y-axis. It does not change the velocity. It does not change the acceleration if you want to estimate it, or of offset for earthquake if you want to estimate it. It does not change any of that. So it's just for a clean look for your physical interpretation of the result. Okay, so we did all those corrections, and then we can, and then we got the final displacement time series, and we can estimate uh, velocity from that, which is done. And then now we can compare the new velocity with the old velocity. And in the new, in, and in the new velocity, we what? We remove, we correct for the RP errors and we also removed the topographical residuals from DM errors. All the others we haven't shown in this class, but I would like you to do that after the class as homework. So uh, for now, let's just check the comparison. And we can see that again, first is the sharp boundaries around this part is gone, which was the RMP error, and now it was removed. And uh, that's basically it. Since, since that's the only corrections we applied so far, the DM error was usually is very helpful, but not in the case of Sentinel-1, because again, the DM error is proportional or the, the contribution of the DM error is proportional to the perpendicular baseline. And in terms of Sentinel-1, it's very small. So it's actually not very uh, impactful in this case. But for the older satellite for or for satellites with large special with large special baseline, such as ALOS-1, uh, MZ or ERS, 
the impact of the DML correction is actually significant. And uh, we got the velocity. Uh, does everyone also got the velocity? Yeah. Great. Okay. So we have the velocity and now we can plot a great. And now we can plot a profile on it. For example, in this case, uh, this is the Hayward fault. Uh, our reference point is here and we can just plot a profile, which is the dash line represents. And the profile looks like on the right. And we can see this is the velocity profile, which means that, that uh, across in this line, we have a velocity gradient or we have a velocity difference from here to here of around uh, three, of around 3.5 millimeter per year, which should be what we expect of the fault creeping uh, along the Hayward fault. So great news. Uh, so that's reasonable and good. And uh, usually once we've done the GP, once we've done the INSAR, uh, you want to compare that if you have GPS on your study area, you want to correct for that. You want to compare that with the GPS. And uh, there's a simple way in MinPy to do that, which is embedded in the, again, the visualization script of your PY. And uh, let's first run it. So it downloads the three-dimensional GPS 10 series from University of Nevada at Reno, which is the displacement 10 series. Um, the whole process is automatically. So you don't need to worry about everything else. And uh, it will download the data and since it's 3D GPS and it will use the instance angle and the asthmus angle from INSAR data to project the 3D GPS time series into the radar line side, into a 1D time series along the line side direction. So that is comparable with our INSAR time series. And this is currently doing that. You can find the downloaded GPS data in the directory, in a local directory. They should have a GPS directory there. Everything, every GPS data is there. Okay, so this is how it looks like. Uh, these are the GPS ID, site ID, or the site names. And then you can see that, of course, again, the background is the velocity we have, and the each circle here uh, represents the GPS site, and the color of the circle is representing the estimated velocity from that projected 1D GPS 10 series. So you can see that in general, uh, the GPS estimated velocity and INSAR estimated velocity is uh, generally consistent in space, right? Except there are some anomalies, for example, here, uh, there's some anomalies in here as well. And we can do a simple statistics of that by plotting us by doing a scatter plot. Well, basically here, the X axis shows the INSAR velocity out of the GPS site the y-axis shows the GPS velocity out of the GPS side. So you can see that the two of them are pretty much consistent with each other. Okay, I think because here I actually manually uh, ex ex excluded some of the GPS set. Let's, if we rerun it, you can see that it's actually not always the case, which is actually the more realistic case. You will find some outliers. Uh, and in this case, these outliers, are we have a very simple preliminary outlier detection just to compare the two and, and then find out those three, uh, find out those five GPS, GPS sites that are very different from INSAR. For example, these are the INSAR velocities and on this side are the GPS velocities. They are very, very different and uh, you would want to uh, investigate in practice uh, what's going on there. And in this case, since we have them, we if we exclude those GPS state, GPS size, and then redo the comparison, then we can see we can get an RMS value, RMSE value between INSAR and the independent GPS, right? In this case, 
we got our inside result without any help of the GPS time series or velocity. So the inside velocity and GPS velocity in this case, they're totally independent from each other. So that's why we can do the comparison uh, or validation. And the validation result is actually pretty good around one millimeter per year. And the R square value is actually extremely high, which confirms that our result is good. So that's it. So that's it so far. So that's it. Um, let's uh, let's let's take some questions before we go a little bit further. Insar, in this case. So um, also ask uh, the insert in general seems faster. Is there a systematic reason for that? Actually, in this case, uh, we see actually the GPS is slightly faster, right? It's a little bit above. And uh, I could think of, and this looks like a, a long spatial wavelength contribution. Uh, something should be not exactly right in INSAR, uh, because here I would trust the GPS measurement here. I could think of the reason, for example, those few corruptions that we have not applied, the solid earth tide, the plate motion, which uh, were correct for some of this large spatial wavelengths part, uh, which I think is maybe my maybe my best guess is the plate motion. Uh, yeah. The plate motion, let's go back a little bit to see what it looks like. The plate motion looks like this, and it will usually introduce a long special wavelength in INSAR. And uh, it's actually more, much more visually visible if we have a, if we have a very large study area. For example, uh, Ali and Kai in their paper showed a very very large area. Okay, not in, not in the paper. Actually, in the in in Ollie's dissertation, he processed the whole the entire Macron subduction zone. So it's basically so it's uh seven Sentinel one tracks. Uh, so eventually he he got a a study area around seven degrees by ten degrees, which is huge, and stitched them together. And at that time, you will see that um the plate motion in this case it was small, right? You can see the loss. The loss velocity is less than two centimeters per year, and but if you stitch them together with a big track with a very very large multiple tracks, then this will accumulate and then becomes super obvious. So my, one of my guess is the is because we have not correct for that, but there may be others. If want someone on to chip in. Yeah, we did a processing exercise for Southern California and we found that a very similar thing. And that was our proposed explanation as well. It was around the same time that, that Ollie's paper came out. So it's like, oh, hang on, that might explain exactly why we don't <laughs> we don't get a perfect one to one match. Yeah, it could be that. I would also say that, that you're projecting the GPS vertical into line of sight, and that could also be quite a lot more uncertain than the horizontal components of GPS. So some of the error could come from the GPS vertical. But I don't know if it would be systematic. I suspect not. Right. So um, one good way to check what is going on around this, for example, around these outlier GPS sites is to just uh, usually go to the Nevada website where you can actually find out, uh, find where where each stations are and look at the time series. For example, if I um, if I check one of the GPS sites, for example, let's say this one, I can do a search. Oops, it's not there, really. Should not be. Okay, yes, right here. If you click that, it will take you to the GPS sites. And then you should be able to see the, uh, 
to see the time series of it. And then you can try to find out what is happening at the GPS site. A lot of times we may find a lot of useful information around here about the maintenance and then the steps or the offsets in the GPS time series, which is usually very useful for, for, for investigation. Um, one person asked, is it possible to stitch tracks, not only frames? Uh, yes, it is possible. Uh, currently, there are actually many different flavors of stitching. Some of them uh, are stitching just by uh, overlapping the two tracks and then shift one of them with a constant offset by calculating the mean difference between the overlapping areas. Um, and not some other people are, but this is actually not, should not be exactly true, right? Because, um, because the, because the instance angle on one in the overlapping area, in the overlapping area, one angle is in the far side, in the far, in the far range, one angle is in the, one instance angle is in the lower range. So if we have a constant, uh, 3D velocity because of this loss instance angle difference, the projected line of sight velocity between the overlapping area when should not be exactly the same unless you unless we perfectly correct it for all those. So some other approaches, for example, in uh in UT San Diego in scripts or in Comet from UK, they did a lot of uh route area study also. Well they are actually using uh the GPS network uh as a reference to stitch multiple tracks of inside data through some optimization. Uh, you can you should be able to find details of how they do that in their papers. Both of all of these are relatively recent, recent two or three years. So it's actually still uh, an active area of research. Okay, before we go further, I think I think we are much overdue, much much run over time. Uh, before I go, before we finish, I just want to show you one last thing, which is a useful thing. We said we are we could uh, estimate a lot of time functions, but we did not really show it. So what I mean is that um, if we plot the displacement time series, um, for example, as shown here, uh, using a script called TSView. And uh, then we can click to find for each pixel how the time series looks like. For example, in here, if we choose right next to the velocity reference point, it's almost flat. And if we choose a point across in the Hayward fault, then it's again pretty uh, tight, but has a velocity, right? Has a velocity of around three millimeter per year. And if we click to, to the substance uh, area here, you get a much bigger um, substance values, a substance velocity. And the scatter also got bigger because it's further away from the reference point. And if we choose here, you can see that it, it's like that it got even worse. And again, from and then from here, you can actually see that there are some seasonal patterns around among the uh, within the time series, which is very interesting. And in this case, below bot at the bottom here is actually the Santa Clara. Uh, aquifer deformation, uh, which is super interesting also. So by checking the displacement time series around many pixels of your data set, you can you, you will grab uh, a sense of how the temporal evolution of your study area is. And based on that, one way is to manually choose a suite of time functions and estimate that instead of a simple linear velocity. So this is what we did here. Instead of a uh, instead of a polynomial one, which is the linear velocity, we estimate a polynomial with an order of two, and then we estimate a periodic function with a period of one year, and we can round that. It should be very fast. Okay, it's done, and we can plot it. So it looks like um, it looks like this, uh, because we have a polynomial of two, we estimated a velocity and its acceleration also. So the velocity looks similar to what we have before, 
but we see the nonlinear deformation, which is the acceleration of this aquifer, which is very visually uh, strong, uh, uh, which is expected, right? As we can see from the earlier times, when we plot at, uh, a point time series, it looks like this. So you can see there's a deacceleration around this region, which is what is shown here. And for the periodic function, which is basically a seasonal function, and from that, we can estimate an amplitude and phase of that uh, shows how big uh, the temporal seasonality is. And we can again say, say, see this region has a much bigger seasonality and this region is also. And uh, the phase of the seasonal behavior is actually also very different. This is actually very fascinating. Uh, I've been looking at this figure for a long time and there's still a lot of things that's going on here, I think. Just show you the phase of the seasonal behavior. Basically the starting point uh, of this seasonal behavior uh, within the year. And I remember Ravina's group had a very nice uh, paper on the Central Valley around the, about the ground, about the deformation from the groundwater there, which is uh, basically using this type of analysis. So yeah, so that's it. And then you can use other time functions also. Uh, the supported time functions in MinPy uh, is described here, uh, including the polynomial periodic, the step function is useful for earthquakes, the exponential and log, and log function, which is usually useful for the post-seismic deformation. Yeah, so that's it. Sorry, I run way over time. It's okay. <laughs> and this is one of the most important things to cover. So I think you did a really good service to everyone by going into that much detail. Thanks. Yeah, so that's this... great. Great. I do so... think we great. might want to take a break. <laughs> so. Yeah. So, Rubina, how long do you, do you reckon you want uh, for a break? Maybe, Airbnb. maybe five. I have to leave at the end of the hour because I have a family commitment. But um, I have been madly deleting slides. So maybe five minutes and I'll just do okay. 20 minutes. a 20 minute blast. Yeah. I'll talk right. really fast. <laughs> we can play, replay you the video at like half speed. Yeah. Um, okay. Back at, in, at, at 140 Pacific. So four minutes. Can you recognize this? Oh, it's the it's the Salton Sea, <laughs> the Imperial Valley, where all the tomatoes come from. Um, get yeah, it's one forty. Let's go. <laughs> Um, so unfortunately, I do have to leave close to the end of the hour. Can everyone hear me okay? All right. Yes. Um, I think that's okay. I had planned on doing a quick note about the future. Um, and then I was going to give an example of a place where you might want to work with high resolution stacks. Um, we've been kind of talking a lot of, about the really neat tools that ARIA has provided. Um, for a lot of those, you don't need necessarily to do stacks of SLCs. Uh, so I think I'll, I'll go through these slides, and then if we have time, I can go through the uh, a notebook I put together that kind of wraps the stack processor. If not, it's not yet been added to the course materials because it's not quite as clean as the others. So I could do that over the next week. Um, and then finally, I had an example of a small stack, that, and just to show some of the metrics, we can pull for them. Again, I can put that where other people can walk through that on their own if they're interested. Um, so the quick future is that um, we've kind of talked about Opera products before. This co-registered SLC product that's going to come out is going to be very, very useful for anyone who wants to do stack processing. Um, there are sample products available already, and I personally am very excited about this. And so it will in some ways mean that you could do all the same metrics and the same math that 
you would do on a stack of radar coordinates SLCs uh, that are produced through the stack processor, you could instead use one of these instead. Um, so maybe everything I would tell you about using the stack processor will be out of date very soon anyway. But only um, in uh, North America. <laughs> yes, although they will make the, the basically the, the code to, to produce this is going to be freely available. So you will be able to go to anywhere you want to and process your own stack um, using those existing products. Um, again, the ones in North America will be available through ASF. Okay, so let me go into an area I've been working in a lot. Um, this is kind of the Arabian Peninsula. And the study example, the thing we're looking at is this region that was affected by a very large typhoon in 2018. I'm going to be focusing on this one track that hits the edge of this typhoon. So it rained here, did not rain here. And the area generally doesn't get a lot of rain. Um, this was an extreme event. Uh, this is a picture of some sand dunes in the northern part of the study area. We could see normally, this is May 13th, right before the storm. All of this is dry. These are 100 meter high sand dunes. And then afterwards, this is May 29th, just a couple weeks later, they had lakes that persisted for many months in this area. Um, and so this is what a coherence map spanning the event looks like. All of these areas in white here are high coherence, these are areas near one, um, and these areas that are much darker are places where it rained. And you can actually, in this one pair, even see kind of individual rain bands that were spinning off of the edge of the storm as it went through. So this is a nice example because we can see the effect of places that did have rain and that did not have rain um, and compare them. And I'm going to be showing you a lot of close-up uh, um, data going to full resolution interferograms that we generated with an SLC stack um, in a place where it rained three times. So this is the big event, but there were two others in our time series. So if we zoom just into this box, this is what the full resolution interferogram looks like. And so you can see um, how it's noisier in these places where it rained, and it's not as noisy in between these rain bands where it was dry. And so if you look at this interferogram, it's about 10 kilometers across in this area. I'm gonna show you how we can use the full resolution data to, use a to make a correction that doesn't actually use this pair at all. It's in completely independent of these two dates. And you go from this to this. So it doesn't get rid of everything, but it gets rid of a lot of the speckle that you see in this data. And that's the sort of thing you can do when you actually start with the full res data and look at a whole stack. So what are the tools we have? Uh, I'm going to talk about, I'm not going to talk about the last one here. We definitely don't have time for that, but we're going to go over a coherence, this quantity I call high pass phase, and then phase closure, which we've been hearing about a lot over the past um, hours. And so this is an, an image showing all possible pairs in um, just in a two year time period. And so this pixel right here is the first date to the second date. This pixel right here is the first date to the very last date. Um, and so all of these, this top row here would be all possible pairs relative to the first date. And then the diagonal would be the sequential pairs, date one, date two, date three, two, date three, et cetera. And so you can see that the longest times pair you could possibly make is still pretty coherent. And it's more coherent than shorter pairs that are, that are in between those states. Another thing to note is that if you look at oops, this point right here, that's between two dates that are wet. I'm gonna, these blue lines basically are dates where it rained. And you can see it's actually higher coherence there where you're comparing, you've made an interferogram between two wet dates than between a dry date and a wet date. So this is one of our data sets. Um, and just to kind of remind you all about what we're doing here, it's the last lecture, we can do a little summary. Uh, we're talking about coherence, and we can kind of think about that as the spatial scatter of the data. I'm going to come back to that later. So here's just a, some fake data I made, a 10 by 10 window with a lot of scatter. If I plotted all of those fake values on a real and an imaginary circle, you can see they're scattered all the way around. I can make a histogram of that. And if I sum all of those vectors up and take their mean value, I would get this little red vector here. So it is a very short length because all of these are scattered around the circle. The length of that vector is often what we call correlation. Um, a less noisy date uh, is something like this. Now everything's much more uh, clustered and that vector would be closer to one. 
So when the vector has a length of one, it's all the val the pixels are kind of in the same phase value. Okay, here's just a couple of other examples. This is from an, a totally different area in Chile, another dry area where there are two rain events. Um, this date and the date here both had rain. And again, you can see that the wet date to wet date is more coherent. Um, here's at different pixels in the time series. This is a place where it never rained at all, coherent all the time. Here's a place where you had flooding during one of the events. And note that any pair that spans this date here is always decorrelated. So that basically means all the pixels got changed and switched over. You either eroded material, you dumped mud in this area, and no pair spanning the event is good quality. However, afterwards, you can kind of see any the dates after the event have higher quality. Whereas here's a pixel where it just rained and we don't have any flooding or anything like that. So lots of stuff you can do in the, just pulled out of one of these stacks. Um, here's another interesting example. Uh, since we're just doing a survey here, this is off the coast of Oman where there are mangroves and um, that are in the tidal zone. So at high tide, the, you've kind of submerged much of the plant. You're just seeing the uppermost leaves. And at low tide, you're exposing both more of the beach, but also these branches that are below water level some of the time. And if you look at the coherence kind of triangle here with all possible pairs, you know there's this kind of sequential thing where there's periods of time that seem to be correlated with each other. And this actually is how the aliasing of our tidal cycle compares to the sentinel 12 day spacing. That's what that is. So you're seeing basically these more coherent time periods are where the branches show and you're comparing branches with branches. Note that periods like right here, this tiny little pixel there, that's a little more coherent, that would be a submerged period to another submerged period. So there's lots of uh, interesting things you can play with there. The other data set is what we're gonna call high pass filtered phase. And so just to kind of show you what I mean by this, imagine you have a profile, or this could be, normally we would estimate this over some box like we do for coherence. And you're thinking about this one red pixel here. Um, any one interferogram will be shifted by kind of a random amount, right? It'll have atmospheric noise, all sorts of other things contributing to the data. But if you remove the mean value of the phase in your local region and kind of shift everything downwards, that what we're calling high pass phase is just this value here. So basically it's the difference of the phase at this pixel to the average of its neighbors. Not anything very complicated here. We do this in the complex dom domain, not on the real value pixels. Um, if you think about that versus time, a bad pixel, something that isn't very stable relative to its neighbors might look like this. So it's high pass filtered phase would be all over the place so between pi and minus pi. Oops, speak. Pi and pi, minus pi, not two pi and two pi. Um, but if you have a, a high quality pixel, once you remove the average of its neighbors, it'll look much more um, consistent over time. So when we look at that over time, we can have another metric of how good data quality is. It's similar to, um, but not exactly what we were calling temporal correlation in the last version. Um, this is what, the average spatial coherence, which is again, estimated over a window, it's not a point-wise me measurement in an agricultural area in California. And here's the same data set, but where I'm looking at kind of the magnitude of that average high pass phase vector. So it gives us a much more high resolution measure of coherence. Um, this is very similar to the metric used in stamps in that uh, software package, if you're familiar with that. So when we look at this high pass phase, it also can show us what's happening when it rains. So here's what the high pass phase looks like for that same area we just looked at before with the three rain events. And notice that the, the, um, the phase at this particular pixel relative to its neighbors is doing the same thing each time. It's always changing kind of with the same sign where it kind of, for these pairs, it's going negative. Um, here it's actually gone it's gone negative, but it actually wrapped over. So it went to minus pi and kind of went a little bit further. So it's up at pi. So in each of these cases, you basically had the same sign of change when that region got wet relative to its neighbors. Other pixels will have, go in the opposite direction or not move as much at all. So we notice this in the data. Um, and if you plot this high pass phase versus just the coherence of all possible pairs, 
here we've also colored them by the change in amplitude between the two dates. You can see there's this really strong relationship. So these really high co coherence pixels here, those are the ones where it didn't rain. And then the three rain events that we see are, are kind of shown in these clusters over here. Notice again, it wraps, it goes down towards minus pi, but then since we are measuring complex value numbers, it wraps up to pi again. Um, so some pixels have a steep distribution like this, other ones don't. Uh, we infer it basically depends on if you have a big rock in the middle of the pixel, so it's not very sensitive to soil moisture versus a pixel that's mostly dirt and is. We also can look at phase closure, which we just got a, an overview today and pre previously in the week. Um, this is the kind of the same sort of quantity that was being discussed earlier at the end, where each pair here is actually, I'm looking at, if you imagine a whole bunch of dates there, I'm looking at every possible pair compared with all of the intervening shortest term pairs. So for instance, this one at the very upper corner is the, the date one to date three compared with date one to two and two to three. And the one here on the end is the first to last date compared with all the intervening dates. And so here in this kind of fairly special area where most of the time nothing's happening at all, you really can see the effects of the rain that you can't necessarily see in most other places in the world. And you can see that every time it rained, we see a, a consistent sign of the jump associated with one of these um, rain events. So since I, it wasn't really covered, I wanted to do a real simple explanation of phase closure just for those who are new to it. Um, we get this again from spatial averaging of complex values where once you have angles involved, the average of A plus B is not equal to the average of A plus the average of B. You get this whenever the, the distribution of values you're averaging is skewed. So, you know, not like a Gaussian, which is symmetric. We can really see this even with something as simple as an average of three vectors. So let's say we have these three vectors here, black, red, and blue. Um, here they're symmetric. You've got kind of the red one is right in the middle. So if I add them up, which is kind of really what we're doing when we take when we filter the data and just take the average, I get this little green vector here, right? So here, in this case, since they're symmetric, it lines up perfectly with my red vector here. And so the kind of the angle of this average is really what we'd expect. Um, the pink that I've shown here is what would happen if I took the average of the angles and the green one is the version where I take the average of the vectors. So the purple one is kind of the unwrapped phase average, and the green one is the wrapped phase average. And I'm going to show a case where they're different. So let's say that instead I have a, a very asymmetric distribution. My blue vector is here at 120 degrees, and the red and black are both at zero degrees. So you might think that 120, zero plus zero, we should get 40 degrees. And in fact, we don't. So you can see that you know, this is what we would expect if we were just averaging the angles or the unwrapped data already. But if you add these up as vectors, you're adding the black to the red to the blue, you get this green vector here. Um, because these are scattered all over the place, the average is short, it has lower coherence, and the angle is different between these two. So as we move this blue vector around and keep the black and red vectors fixed, we can actually just plot how that average changes. And so you can see here, this is showing the angle of that blue vector. If it is also zero and all three angles are the same, of course, you get no, no difference between the wrapped and unwrapped average. But as you get to larger and larger values, the difference between these wrapped and unwrapped averages gets larger and larger, right? So no, this is just trigonometry. Um, and, but if you imagine this in terms of time series analysis, let's say we have three time intervals where this vector is zero, 50, and 100 degrees in terms of the phase. Um, so the first time interval in zero to one will be 50 degrees. So my wrapped average black here, this is what I get from filtering the data will be right below the unwrapped average. They're pretty close. Um, in one to two will also be 50 degrees. 100 minus 50 is 50. But in zero to two, which is the whole is the longer time interval will be 100 degrees. And because of this nonlinearity, you now have a, a fairly big difference here. And so this value, the black value here times two, does not equal this value here, right? So that's really where the phase closure comes from in a nutshell. When you actually do spatial averaging of these distributions that are 
not symmetric. You get all sorts of arc tans and things like that in there that when you apply those to a time series, they add up over time. Um, so again, anything that gives you a non-symmetric distribution will do this. This could be deformation, say strain within your averaging window if you're filtering the data a lot, some types of atmospheric noise, decorrelation, of course, will give you just randomly value, values, soil moisture, or even heterogeneous pixels. So one pixel that's sitting there not doing anything like a big rock and soils that are kind of uh, doing diff have different behavior. Um, and anyway, if this is random in time, there should not be any net closure phase bias. There'll be phase closure, non-zero phase closure in every pair, but it'll be distributed around zero. Um, if you have a correlation in your signal over time that's contributing to this, then you'll get a bias like we see in this other data. Um, so here, we see a bias. It's the same sign every time it rains. Um, I also wanted to note there's been quite a few papers that go back a little further than what, what was mentioned earlier by Francisco Dazan where he, he's been working on this for the past decade or so. Um, so here's the correction approach, just to show you what you could do. So we take the statistics of the noise that we think are going on, we convert coherence to this soil moisture metric. I don't really have time to go through that now. We have a paper coming out hopefully very soon, um, but it's very similar to coherence. We fit a slope to the line at every single separate pixel because they all have different relationships. Um, and then this is basically telling you how sensitive that particular pixel is to soil moisture change. Um, so S is constant in time. It's just this pixel is, does, has a certain response, whereas the soil moisture metric changes over time, but is relatively smooth in space. We don't have rain falling on one pixel and not on the neighboring pixel. Um, so when we do that, here's how, how well it works. So the high pass phase for this pixel I showed you looked like this. After the correction, it looks like this. And again, we did not use this middle event for this correction. So the two dates on either side of this, which would be kind of this region and this region here, were not used, but we still get a good correction effect at those dates. Um, here's the coherence and phase closure I showed after the correction. It doesn't get rid of everything, but it does get rid of quite a bit, especially on the phase closure side. So this tells us that even the simple model is seeing something in the data that we otherwise are going to, to miss if we just spatially average everything. Um, here's just a distribution of coherence before. So this is uh, the higher areas are places. This is just for that rainy interferogram that we didn't use in the correction. And um, this is the area, areas where it rained, and this is where it didn't rain. And here it is after the correction with a couple different statistical models. So we do better, um, but again, it doesn't get rid of everything. Um, and just to kind of show you again, why I picked an area in California to look at. There's stuff like this all over the place. We see lots of phase biases, not even looking at phase closure. Um, and I won't go any further because I think I'm out of time. But I will, I promised to add these to the notebook um, lists and where people can look at them if they have any further questions. And please reach out to me with, by email if you need to follow up. Whew. Thank you. I do have to leave. I have to go take care of my kids, but it was nice seeing you all. I had a wonderful week. I'm back next year. <laughs> um, thanks, Marina. Um, okay, it's two o'clock. Are there questions? Maybe maybe you could slack the questions and Marina can answer them there. Um, okay, we're at the end of our our, our schedule for today and for the week. Um, just to remind you what 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 um we have uh the demands we still have for you. <laughs> uh, like every other day, we have homeworks. Uh, so this is today's syllabus down at the bottom here. Maybe Yunjun could explain exactly what he's looking for you to do. But um, it's, it seems to be um, some some more mid pie analyses with changing some things, right? Yes. Um, so um, one thing is the reference point selection. Uh, we know it's manual. Actually, there is automatic one, but it was never good enough. So always a manual selection is recommended. And uh, there are notes on that uh, template option. I want you, everyone, to 
choose a reference point of your of your own choice and then with a justification of your choice why you choose it and why you think it's a good one the second is the troposphere correction we did not uh, demonstrate that live uh, but it's very important and I actually run use that all the time for all my analysis and uh, the one that I use the most is the Pi APS using the ERA5 weather reanalysis data set. Uh, one of the trick is the account setup similar to the earth data that, that you have been using all the week. Uh, the ERA5 data set also requires account registration and uh, you need to sign the um, the terms also which has a demonstration, which has, you can find the link on the notebook and on the PyAPS uh, repository on GitHub, where you will find all the information you needed for the account setup. Please do that and then apply the tropospheric correction to your dataset also. And uh, please also try the sort of earth tide correction, which should be really easy uh, just by turn on and off of the template option. The second part uh, homework is the time function. Uh, so we showed uh, one example of the suite of time functions. I would like you to try uh, by checking the, this data set or your data set of interest, see um, the temporal behavior you would expect from a data set and then choose an appropriate suite of time functions and then show the result of that. Thanks. Thank you. Um, and for all of the homeworks, um, we would like you to finish them, everything, by the end of next week. So September 1st is the last day to submit homeworks, um, if you would like to do that and have it counted. Um, there is no 5.3 notebook because it was the same notebook as 5.2. <laughs> if in the case that was unclear. We just carried on in, in the afternoon session with the the one we used in the morning. Um yeah, so like what what's left is uh the, the post course. Um we have a few things prepared for you. One is a um one is a, a post course survey that Melissa will send out um once we are done here. Uh, we'll also put it in the syllabus and we'll link it in the um in Slack. Um, another thing is if you complete the majority of the, of the, of the homeworks, um, and complete both surveys, we will make you a certificate saying that you took this course. Um, these details are also in the syllabus. I should go back to it. Um, uh, just down here, um, there will be a post-course survey. I'll put the link here when, when we have it, the OSL system will be up for two more weeks. Um, so that you can you can access your files and if you have anything that is special to you that you did during the course of this workshop uh, you can download it to your computer um in that time so that you can so that you can keep it um after september 8th the osl system specifically the earthscope insar course um system will will be taken down um so don't lose anything in that time that you don't uh that don't don't leave anything that you want to keep on there beyond that time it will it will go away um and one more thing um yes the certificates will, will be given out to people who do the majority of the homeworks and both surveys so if you did the so if you've um filled out both surveys and completed all the homeworks then we can send you a certificate um after september 1st And on the OSL, um, so you don't really have to download the original notebooks that came with this course. Uh, they will remain on GitHub. Um, you will retain access to the other uh, Open Star Lab deployments. So when you go in, there are two, right? So you have the one, the UNAFCO one, and you have the ASF one. That's the good. ASF one will remain. Uh, you'll retain access to that. And you can always clone that repository into uh, your open star lab deployment if you want to and um and um and keep working with these notebooks uh the um um conda environment that you need uh, to run these notebooks is also available on the uh, asf open star lab so you can build that conda environment and it should all work just fine 
if what I would download from the current deployment is if you've made changes to notebooks that you want to keep, uh, you can right click on the notebook and then click download. If you've created some science products that you want to keep, you can download those. There isn't a huge need to download the data we used in this notebook. They will remain in the S3 bucket. You can always re, you know, rerun those notebooks and re-download them. Um, um, also, you know, whatever data you downloaded from ASF, they will remain on the archive and you can just re-download them later. It's mostly the IP that you created if you, you know, changed it in your notebooks or some science product that you may have created you want to keep. I would download those. Yeah, there's a there's a question uh, about processing your own stacks. Uh, so Rowena will show her notebook, and uh, you could also go back to the previous year's recordings uh, on GitHub and uh, YouTube. You will find the previous year's versions of the demonstration demonstration live on terminals. You can you should not be able to process that stack on OSL because of the disk limit. So you could process that on your own computers afterwards. And uh, the node, uh, let me, maybe I'll just show that very quickly. Yeah. Paris, friends? Yeah. Very um, quickly. <laughs> yeah, very quickly. <laughs> But yeah, um, so we can we can try and extract the video from last year and and put it on in the syllabus, link it, and yeah. So, um, on the on the GeoSync repository, uh, if you go to five point four, uh, this was the material copied over from last year. Um, so you will be using for stack processing. You will be using uh top stack or street map stack which is basically the stack version the stack version of the tops app and the street map app it will do the exact same thing but in a systematic way to all pairs and then they will be consistent uh in space and will be directly uh compatible with uh, mintpy uh in case that you have study areas that you don't have the array products or or you don't, or or you want to just process your own. And the key uh, documentation of that is there is uh, ice tools documentation. So if you go to click the link here, or just go to the ice two on GitHub, on the first page you will see running ice stack processors. Go there, and it will bring you directly to the code that they have. We have three stack processors, and then it will show you the extra installation is needed to run the stack processors. And if you, for example, if you click one of them, the top stack, it will show you how to run them. Uh, don't worry about the words. It is relatively long, but you, uh, but I, I promise you all the details here has you have been already taught in this class is exactly the same as top, almost exactly the same as top stack. So you should be able to run them. Yeah, so that's it. Thank you. That was quick. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. So what, what remains, Franz? Anything else that we should talk about? Nothing else. I put a, a link in for a YouTube video um, if you are interested in working. So uh, there's a lot of ARIA products available these days. Uh, so what Yunjun just showed you can work for a lot of regions uh, and there are very deep time series stacks for those available. So you should try that. If the area you're interested in doesn't currently have any ARIA data sets available, which is possible, uh, you can work with ASF's um, on-demand tools. And I put a link uh, to a YouTube video in that sort of walks you through how you order the data, sort of a time series data stack uh, using ASF's tools and then how you run that through MinPy. Uh, we have a, a version of MinPy that is compatible with these data sets uh, and it's gonna show you how to use it. Um, I guess otherwise, 
thank you for all of your patience throughout this week and your participation. And uh, hopefully you found it useful um, and will maybe become a, a, you know, a participant in a training in the future. We are always looking for folks uh, to help us uh, teach this course in the future. So if you're interested in being a TA or being an instructor in one of the future courses, please let us know. Um, and uh, we'll take you up on that. And I was a student of this class nine years ago. It didn't hurt your career. No, I think not. I took it four years ago. <laughs> I still have the certificate saved in my laptop. <laughs> nice. Um, one more thing to say is that thanks to Melissa for for being a stalwart um, uh, logistics person behind the scenes, and also to Alex and Eric at ASF, who have uh, been letting you in and fixing stuff and all of that. Without those people, this course could not have happened. So thanks to you all too. Um, and with that, maybe maybe we can call this a, a day or call it a course. There are questions still in the Q and A that haven't gotten answered. Yes, well, I think if you have a question that is burning uh, your insides, please post it in the Slack channel uh, before we shut this thing down, <laughs> and we will see if we can get get to your questions on online. Um, we'll keep we'll keep monitoring the Slack for all of next week um, to try and solve issues that that uh, that come up as they arise. Um, Otherwise, thanks everybody for your attention and uh, hopefully we'll see you at a conference sometime. Yeah, I'll say hi if you see us at a conference. I see people do and it always surprises me <laughs> still. <laughs> Bye all. See you, everybody. Bye everyone. <laughs>